Hey everyone, my name is Josh. Um, I'm here today with uh, Amit and Yash, who are deep at work, but if you guys want to raise your hands and say hi. Um, we're all from the TensorFlow team. They're both super smart and they're happy to help answer your questions and we'll switch back and forth presenting. Um, so today we're going to cover uh, how to get started with TensorFlow 1.9 and we have lots of good news for you, especially around ease of use. So from my perspective, this release is all about ease of use. Um, Here's what we're going to walk through. This is more of a uh, beginner's tutorial. So obviously, deep learning and TensorFlow are both very large subjects. And the goal today is not to be comprehensive, but my goal is to give you the most effective way possible to start writing your TensorFlow programs, meaning the shortest path to shortest amount of code to train neural networks effectively with the least amount of uh, hair pulling and confusion. So I hope this will be uh, useful. So basically, we're going to do four uh, beginner's notebooks. Um, these are all inspired by a book, and I'm going to butcher the name because I don't speak French, by Francois Cholet, 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 who's the author of Keras, which is a fantastic high-level API for deep learning. Then we're going to do a couple advanced notebooks, which shows, um, yeah, some new things that weren't possible before. And we'll do some games on the way, and it'll be fun. This is mostly hands-on. I'm going to start with probably like a 10 or 15 minute just quick overview of what's new in TensorFlow, and then the rest of the session will be hands-on. Um, what I really want to focus on is TensorFlow, actually, just so I can calibrate, who has written any TensorFlow before? All right, so like about a third of you. Uh, okay, so this is great. So if you're not aware, so TensorFlow has a large API stack. It powers, it powers almost every machine learning project at Google, which means it runs both at scale as well on small devices. It runs in JavaScript, on Android, on iOS on GPUs, on TPUs. Anyway, it's a large framework with a large stack. So there's a lot of different moving pieces. And what I want to point you to today is uh, the best APIs to start with, um, to get rolling. Uh, we're going to do everything in Colab. So this is SciPy. So I assume a lot of folks are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. If you're not, I'll give a quick overview. All of the code from today is going to run in something called Colab. And I'll just show you what that is right now. It's basically a free web-based Jupyter Notebook. Um, you can actually pull it up right now. It's a really good resource to be aware of. If you go to the URL, colab.research.google.com. So C-O-L-A-B dot research.google.com. Let me actually stick that on as well. I have that on a slide later for you. But colab.research.google.com. And this will open up a web-based Jupyter notebook. And it means uh, it has TensorFlow pre-installed, so there's nothing to install. You'll be able to jump right in into writing and running code. Uh, what's great about Colab, too, you can download anything you write in Colab as a regular Jupyter Notebook. There's no lock-in. If you don't like it, you can just run everything locally. Uh, but anyway, it's great. It's great for education and demos and stuff like that. So we'll come back to Colab. It's awesome. It also comes with a free GPU, uh, which is great. So this is the sequence of notebooks we're going to cover. So we'll start with something called MNIST. And I know people have been doing machine learning for a long time. Uh, are going to probably grow in when we do MNIST. But the purpose of this is just to show you a quick way to write it. Uh, then we'll do some text classification, some basic regression. Uh, we'll explore a few machine learning concepts. And then we'll look at text generation. And we probably won't have time, but we can look at something really fancy at the end uh, that you can continue reading on home for machine translation. All right, so quick slides, and then we will uh, get started. So the, basically, the only uh, key point I want to make about TensorFlow, so uh, it's, it's been around for about two years. We've been developing it really rapidly. But I wanted to mention, there's, I think now we're up to about 1,500 total uh, developers who have committed to the TensorFlow code base. About 500 are from within Google, and over 1,000 now are from outside of Google. So TensorFlow is very much uh, an open source community project. And it's extremely important to us uh, to uh, keep it that way and get uh, more and more engagement from the community. Um, one of the things we're working on for the 1.10 release, we're at 1.9 now, is we're trying to pull uh, some of the docs and the tutorials into a separate GitHub repo. And the reason I want to do this is um, a great way to make contributions to an open source project, even if you're new to it, is helping to write just basic tutorials that explain the parts that you struggled with to other people that are new to the library. And I think by having this in their own repo, it will make it easier to contribute. Um, so that should be really cool. And as I, was, as I was saying earlier, because it's a large code base, there's a lot of moving parts. 
So the main takeaway today is what to focus on and what not to focus on. Uh, anyway, it's being developed rapidly. I don't really have anything specific to say about this that you can't find online, uh, so I'm just going to blaze through that. As I was saying earlier, it runs on many different devices. So at a high level, almost everyone writes TensorFlow code in Python. Um, TensorFlow is powered uh, by a C++ backend. And today, we're not going to worry about the backend too much in the same way as when you write Python programs, you don't need to worry too much about how they're compiled down into bytecode and executed. So we're going to focus just on the Python front end. There's also something called TensorFlow.js, which is fantastic. And you can write really, really excellent TensorFlow programs in JavaScript. If you look on the website, in truth, TensorFlow says it supports many, many different languages, including things like Java. And it does. But almost always, when you're training models, when you're writing code to train models, you're pretty much doing it in Python, uh, JavaScript, or R. A lot of the other languages, the support is mainly for serving models that you've already trained. So almost everyone should begin writing TensorFlow in Python, unless you're a JavaScript developer. TensorFlow.js is awesome. Or if you're an R developer, uh, TensorFlow in R is also very, very good. All the other languages, are, I think, are still in the oven. So basically start in Python if you can. You'll have the easiest time. Uh, this is stuff that I was just talking about. So TensorFlow is not just a Python API for training and serving models. There's a giant collection of projects, everything from putting code into production. And this is exactly the same code base we used to serve production code at Google. By the way, with TensorFlow, there's no secret sauce. So the open source code is exactly what we use internally, um, which is one of the reasons why it's a giant code base. Um, yeah, but it's great. Um, so things we care about and we're focusing on today is making all this easier to use. So we're a week ahead of this, but I hope early next week we're updating the TensorFlow Getting Started page. And it's going to have a lot of the materials that we're looking at today. But basically, it just contains more beginner-friendly exercises for the different APIs. And I think it's a much more sensible way to dive in than it is now. But um, broadly, uh, the exercises we're going to look at today are the ones, and I know this is tiny, from the top left quadrant, which is the easiest way to start learning and using machine learning. So we're just going to preview this before it comes out. Um, TensorFlow offers, also offers APIs for things like research, which we'll look at, as well as training and deploying giant models. And all these are compatible, but we're going to start with uh, learning and using ML. So broadly, here are the four API styles. Um, if anyone has used a library called Keras, uh, we have really, really good news. So has anyone used Keras, by the way? Have you liked it? Have people had? It's generally a very positive experience working with Keras. So. <clears throat> If you're new to Keras, basically, when you define your neural networks, one task you have to do is lay down a sequence of layers. And one way to think of Keras is it's broadly an API for defining and training networks using Lego-like building blocks. What's interesting about Keras is it doesn't actually have uh, an implementation to execute it. So Keras is an API spec. And it, traditionally, it runs on top of other deep learning libraries. So you can run Keras on top of TensorFlow. You can run it on top of MXNet or CNTK. But in addition to that, we've also incorporated Keras into TensorFlow. And that means you can write Keras code, vanilla Keras code, in exactly the same way you would in standard Keras inside TensorFlow. And that's just as good as writing any other TensorFlow code. And that's what we'll look at today. If you care, you can also greatly extend that uh, with these other bits of the API to do fancier things that I'll show you later. So cool, uh, I just said stuff like this. So Keras is Lego-like building blocks for defining your neural networks. If you wanted to use Keras outside of TensorFlow, this is how you, in, in, how you would install it. You just do pip install Keras. I have the bang there because all this code I'm pretending would run inside a Jupyter notebook. So you just do pip install Keras, and then you're good to go. And by default, this would also install TensorFlow behind the scenes and use it as the back end. That's not what we're going to do today. So we're going to start using something called tf.keras. And this is TensorFlow's implementation of the Keras API. Uh, it's a superset. So it's everything you're used to from Keras, plus integration with things like eager execution and estimators and distributed training and all this jazz that we'll get into later if we have time. Um, and the thing that I'm most excited about is, in my opinion, this is uh, the easiest way to write TensorFlow code uh, for sure while you're getting started. So here's how this looks. 
uh, using Keras inside TensorFlow. So you don't need to do pip install Keras. You can just do pip install TensorFlow. You won't even need to do this when we're using Colab because it's already there. And then you just import Keras from TensorFlow. And you're good to go. So I'm not gonna walk through this step by step. Uh, we're gonna do this in the first notebook. But I just wanna show you briefly what the complete code looks like to train your first uh, neural network for MNIST uh, using Keras inside TensorFlow. Uh, would anyone like an intro to MNIST? Who has not looked at MNIST before? All right, I'm gonna do it. Um, if you have looked at MNIST and you don't need this intro, uh, I would go to colab.research.google.com and just start reading some of the doc there. Uh, anyway, so basically, actually I'll tell you what. The best way to introduce MNIST, instead of me walking you through it, let's Let's just go straight to hands-on time, because it's the very first notebook anyway, so this will be more efficient. So to get started, if you go to github.com slash tensorflow slash workshops, and then there's nothing to clone in this repo, what you should do is just scroll down and look at the readme. So if you scroll down, these are links to the exercises for today. And if you click on them, they'll open up directly in Colab. So all these files are also on GitHub. I know my URL bar is incredibly tiny, um, but if you look at you, your URL bar, there's this cool trick you can do in Colab where the first half of the URL is the Colab URL, and then the second half is a path to a notebook on GitHub. So you can actually see where these are hosted. So these are all living in the TensorFlow getting started examples uh, that haven't published on the homepage yet. Um, but yeah, so it's a great way to open up a notebook from GitHub. So this is the first exercise we're gonna do today. And I'll walk you through it briefly. And then let's take uh, 10 minutes and you all can read through it and run this on your own and try and modify it a little bit. So I wish I could make this bigger. By the way, a couple features of Colab, in case you're new to it, that are super useful. Um, first of all, it's a Jupyter Notebook. In 10 seconds, for people who are new to Jupyter Notebooks, they're a list of cells. Nothing to do with TensorFlow, this is just a wonderful part of the Python ecosystem. Broadly, there are two types of cells. One is a markdown cell, so this is markdown, and all cells can be edited or executed. If you edit a markdown cell, edited and executed, and you execute it, uh, it renders the markdown. And you can execute a cell by hitting shift enter. Um, and code cells, if you hover over it, will have a play button. Code cells, if you edit it, you're writing code. And if you execute it, you're running code. Now, just like the Python interpreter, Colab programs have a state. So it's best to run these cells in order, uh, just like you would any Jupyter notebook. Um, if you get hosed and you need to restore this to a clean state, the easiest way to do that is runtime restart runtime, and that will restart your Python session. Let me show you some other things too before we get started. One thing you might want to do, although it's not necessary for these exercises, is to enable the GPU. And to enable the GPU, if you go to Edit, Notebook Settings, and then if you look at the Hardware Accelerator, you can hit GPU. If you're seeing things that are not GPUs, that's because I'm logged into Corp but you should just see GPU. So in this thing, in, the, uh, in this thing, in this uh, button in the top right, connect, if you hover over connect, click connect, and then in a moment, it should connect to a, a Python backend backed by GPU. Um, if we run out of GPUs, you should get an error message. It doesn't matter, we don't need them for the exercises we're gonna run today. One thing to avoid in deep learning, a lot of, uh, one mistake a lot of beginners make is they find out that, oh, like GPUs are a big deal in deep learning. So they run out and they buy a machine with a fancy GPU and then find out that you really don't need it unless you're running large scale experiments. So my advice would be just start, if you, if you need hardware acceleration, save your money, start on the cloud. If you decide later you wanna buy something, go buy something. But no one should feel the need to buy any hardware just to learn TensorFlow. All right, um, so let me just walk you through this cell by cell 
and then you guys can do that. So this is the complete code to train a neural network on uh, what we call the fashion MNIST data set. And I'll get to that in a sec. But the very first cell, oh, one more thing I wanted to show you before I start running this code. Another great feature of Colab is snippets. So there's this table of contents thing, but if you click on snippets, these are little code snippets that you can search for. So let's say I wanted to upload a file from my local file system into Colab. I have no idea how to do that. But if I search for upload, so here's a code snippet, and I can scroll down with my funny resolution. And anyway, I'll see the uh, code that I need to copy and paste in. So Colab is really sweet. You can also save these notebooks to Google Drive if you feel like it. You can also save them to GitHub uh, if you feel like it too, which is great. All right, so the first thing we're doing, uh, if I run this cell, as you might imagine, it's importing TensorFlow. If you want to install TensorFlow locally and you don't want to use Colab, if you go to tensorflow.org, there are installation instructions. But for right now, I'd recommend just using Colab. It's easier. The next thing we're doing, as I mentioned earlier, is we're importing Keras. And what you can do is, just for now, think of Keras as an API style. That's all it is. You're probably, because it's SciPy, NumPy, and Matplotlib as always. And then this is important to do because TensorFlow is being developed rapidly. And so what we're looking at here is this is 1.9 RC2. So uh, 1.9 should be final in about a week. But this is the second release candidate. So we usually do release candidates while the releases are, are baking. Um, and they're usually pretty much bug free, but not always. If you have issues with the releases, we happen to have <laughs> Ahmed here, who is our release manager. So uh, he's the expert. Uh, this code will only work, by the way, in 1.9 or higher. So if you try and run this locally, just make sure you have that version. So the reason we're starting with MNIST is it's basically the hello world of computer vision. And what MNIST is, it's a database from Jan LeCun, who's at NYU now. Um, it's almost 30 years old. And it's a collection of 60,000 handwritten digits uh, that are 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 9. So it's basically, you can think of it as a task from the post office where somebody writes a zip code and your job is to machine read the zip code, um, except we're reading one digit at a time. Uh, it's a good data set for hello world to computer vision because it's very small. Each of the images are 28 by 28 pixels and they're grayscale so it fits into memory nicely and you can quickly train models. Because MNIST has been beaten to death by thousands of tutorials over the years, there's a a uh, version of it called Fashion MNIST, which is a different data set in exactly the same uh, format, meaning that any code that works with MNIST, you can just swap the data set to Fashion MNIST without changing your code. And Fashion MNIST uh, is 60,000 images of articles of clothing. And so it's slightly harder than MNIST. And so basically we have dresses, skirts, hats, shoes, sandals, stuff like that. And our job is to train a model uh, from the training set. I'm gonna keep the machine learning, by the way, in this uh, tutorial to a minimum and just try and focus as much as I can on TensorFlow. So our job is to train a model from the training set and evaluate it on the test set. If you're new to ML in general, we're gonna close with a lot of educational resources to help you uh, get rolling there. All right. So the next block of code uh, the good news is this data set is built in to TensorFlow, so there's nothing for us to do. So we're going to import it, and we're going to download it. And I think we'll find out if this is still hilariously hosted. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we have a cloud too, but uh, I guess it wasn't quite up to this, so. Our friends at Amazon have this data set hosted for us. And so we've downloaded the data set. The labels one thing you're going to find out really quickly, by the way, when you start developing with uh, Keras inside TensorFlow is that machine learning is very, very concept heavy, but it's a very, very code light. So this notebook is small, and it does a lot of really interesting things. So where we are right now in ML, and I'm really happy about this, is most of your time is going to go to understanding you know, what and why are we trying to do. The how, meaning how do we get the syntax, is super important. But this is, um, and there's still a lot of work to be done if you're new to this, nobody's going to run this code for the first time and be like, oh, I get it. Like, I totally understand how to use Keras now. Uh, but it's nothing compared to what it was even two years ago. So the APIs are getting much, much better. Anyway, just for convenience, 
Uh, the class labels or the name of the images that we're trying to predict are not included with this data set. So we're just going to manually enter them inside the notebook. So this is just for our convenience. About half of your life when you're developing networks is spent understanding the data type and the shapes of the data that you're trying to work with. So it's good programming practice when you can, as you go, print out the shapes of your different objects. Uh, print out the data types, print out one of the objects, and just poke around with the data and understand it. And this will make your life much easier when you're debugging down the road. So what we've done is we've printed out the shape of the train images. By the way, TensorFlow, you can think of TensorFlow as array flow. A tensor is an n-dimensional array. So a scalar, a vector, you know, a square, a cube. They're just arrays. And all tensors have a shape. And this is the dimensions of the array. So what we're looking at here, this means that there are 60,000 images in this data set, each of which is 28 by 28 pixels. And there's a dimension here, one. It's just, they're all floats. We can also look at the labels. So when you do your machine learning, you always start with data and labels. And uh, the labels tell you what you're trying to predict given the data. And so here we have 60,000 labels. You always have to match the number of labels uh, with, the, uh, with the data. And if we look at the format of the labels, we can see that the very first label is a nine, and that's telling us the first image is a nine. So, so far, we've done no machine learning at all. We've just imported the data set. Here, what we're doing is we've given some code to print out uh, the first element from the data set. So this, to me, looks like a shoe or a boot. And if we scroll up into the labels, this is a nine. Yeah, that's a nine. That's an ankle boot. Other things we're going to do is we're still working with the data. <clears throat> Neural networks prefer, when you're classifying images, one of the things you want to do is pre-process or normalize your data. And networks prefer values to be between 0 and 1. So as imported, the pixel values range between 0 and 255, and we're just going to normalize them to be between 0 and 1. So here, what we've done is we've just written some debugging code. And this is just iterating over the data set and displaying some images. And later, when we train the model, we're going to overlay this plot with the predictions we make to see what we get right and see what we get wrong. All right, so now we actually get to write some TensorFlow. So, um, and this is where things get uh, really helpful. So, Keras has different APIs. Uh, broadly, there's the sequential API. And sequential means I am going to define a neural network as a stack of layers. It's literally a stack of layers. And this is great when you have one input and one output. And so here, our input is an image, and our output is going to be a label. Keras also has the functional API, which we might get into later, and it has something called model subclassing, which we'll get into later. <coughs> but 95% of the time, uh, the simplest API is almost certainly going to be enough uh, for use cases. So. <laughs> This first line of code, we're also publishing a programmer's guide for this, which explains Keras in a lot of detail, which is great. Um, so the first thing is, hey, I'm using the sequential API. Here comes a stack of layers. The first layer is not doing any ML. This is just pre-processing. So what we're doing is these images are images, meaning they're 2D. And just to make life easier, we're saying there are neural networks that work with 2D images. They're called convolutional networks. For this Hello World exercise, we're just saying, hey, you know what? I actually don't care that it's an image. I'm going to turn this thing into a vector. This is just to make our life easier. So we're unrolling the image. We're flattening it, which means unroll all the, ro unroll all the rows, line them up into one long vector. So now we just have a list of numbers. When we do this, we lose some information about the 2D structure. But for this data set, it doesn't matter all that much. The next thing we're doing is we're adding a dense layer. and so. This is our first neural network layer. And um, if you want to learn more about what these 
dense layers are doing. I have a talk from Google I.O. Uh, which goes through a slightly older version of this code with diagrams of the dense layers. Here I'm going to keep the ML light so we can just move through TensorFlow. But anyway, you can think of broadly, a neural network is a stack of layers. And broadly speaking, every unit or every neuron in a layer is computing features of the input. So what this, what every single neuron, here we have 128. And by the way, that number is pulled out of a hat. Uh, one of the major tasks, and this is kind of hilarious, when you're developing networks, there's different knobs that you can tune and you can play with. One such knob is how many layers would I like to add to my network? The more layers you add to your network, the greater the capacity. And what that means is the larger the number of patterns that your network is capable of learning, right? So larger networks can learn more complex data sets, but there's downsides too. So when we're training a network, and this, in machine learning, there's a fundamental tension between memorization and generalization. We have a bunch of training data, 60,000 images. What we, we're using these to train a network. What we really want to do is have a network that's accurate on images it's never seen before. So we want to do well on new data. Now, if we define a network, say we use five layers, and each layer, let's say we have 500 units, this thing is going to get 100% accuracy on our training set. And that's called memorizing the data. It's going to learn it super fast, no problem. The problem is it's going to do something called overfit. So when we try it on new data, ideally, we want it to learn patterns, like, oh, sevens have a shape, eights have two circles. A giant network will literally just memorize I know of 8,000 different eights. They look exactly like this. So it won't be useful on new data. Smaller networks are more likely to learn patterns that generalize because they have less memory to work with, so they have to focus on patterns. Um, so what we often do is when we do our experiments, we'll start with a reasonable design from a network. And you start, no one has intuition for this when they start using deep learning. So I would never expect somebody to look at a problem and be like, oh, you know, this, this is like a reasonable network designed to start with. We know that this is a reasonable place to start with empirically, meaning this data set's very old, we've run different experiments, so we know this is an okay place to start with. So anyway, here's our first layer. And uh, all layers have something called an activation, which I'm not gonna go into right now. Um, broadly, this is not something you need to spend too much time on just to get going. All layers, with MNIST, we're doing multi-class classification, meaning we have one input and it can get dropped into 10 different buckets. <coughs> when you have 10 different buckets, the output layer, you can take it on faith that it needs to be softmax for right now. And what that means is output a probability distribution. So this last layer, let's start from the bottom. The last layer is gonna be a probability distribution over all the classes that an image could be classified as. And softmax just means convert the evidence into a probability. And all the interior layers can end with ReLU. And that's just the right activation function to use for your interior layers. Anyway, we have more details in the uh, notes. One problem with these concepts, and one thing that's both a, both a blessing and a curse of doing machine learning tutorials, is we could do a whole class on just how any one of these pieces works. So we need to move a little bit fast. Anyway, in Keras, there's broadly three steps. The first is you define your model architecture, which we've done here. The next is you need to compile it. So when you compile a network, there's really two things you need to provide. The first is the optimizer. And so networks are trained by backpropagation and gradient descent. And the optimizer is the thing that's going to do that. There are different optimizers with different strategies you can use. The good news is this particular one called Atom is basically the right place to start. So when you're getting started, just use Atom, move on with life. The next thing you need is a loss function. And this is a long and complicated word. Also good news, there's a bucket of loss functions. And over time, you learn which is the correct loss function for the problem you're working with. What we're doing with sparse categorical cross entropy. The reason we're using this is the labels we have are one, two, three, all the way up to nine. And what happens is when the network makes a prediction, there's 
10 units in the last layer, we get a probability distribution. So let's say the image is a seven. Ideally, what we want is there to be very low evidence on all the nodes for zero, one, two, high evidence on seven, and low evidence everywhere else. And what TensorFlow does is it compares the thing the network predicted, which is some distribution, to the thing you wanted it to predict. And that's an output layer with all zeros everywhere and a one on the seven. So it basically looks at your loss. Loss is a fancy word for error. And then what it does is it tries to optimize the weights in your network to reduce the loss. And sparse categorical cross entropy is just a function that tells you how to look at the label you wanted to predict, compare it to the thing you did predict, and get a number that represents how bad a job you did. And TensorFlow will try and optimize that number by adjusting the weights in your network. So after that, by the way, as, as we're going, one thing that's important to understand is there's, this is super concept heavy. So I've mentioned things like loss, optimizers, all this stuff. Here's a really good resource. If you search for Google Machine Learning Crash Course. So this is going to be super helpful. So Machine Learning Crash Course. This is a free class from Google. Uh, here's some useful things about it. So it does a great job explaining what is loss, what is an optimizer. And I think it's your best resource. It's not a full course. We're talking maybe like 10 hours of content. But it's an excellent resource for understanding concepts I mentioned here that you're not already familiar with. However, I would skip all the code. So use it for the concepts. Don't bother with the coding exercises. Because the APIs used in this class, in my opinion, are much more complicated than what we're going to do today. So just concepts, no code. When we're fitting, fit is another word for train. At this point, we're ready to train our model. And if we train it, we're passing it the training images and the training labels. There's only one parameter we need to provide. And this is one of the few parameters in machine learning where there is a right answer, and it's your job to find it. So I mentioned earlier, and I know I'm a little hand wavy, when we're defining the network, I'm like, the activation for the intermediate layers, ReLU is just the right answer. There's a box of things you can try. Almost always it doesn't matter. Almost always go with ReLU. So that's something you can just take on faith and just do, and you'll almost always succeed. Epochs, though, is something that has to be set properly for every individual problem you work on. And there's no way to know it in advance. So epochs means, what an epoch is, we have a training set. And an epoch is one sweep over the entire training set where we're updating the model, uh, where we're training the model as we go over the data. So another word for epochs, or another you could think of epochs as meaning, how long should we train this network? And if you train it for too short a period of time, the network won't do a good job at classifying data. It won't have learned enough patterns. If you train it for too long, it's going to learn overly specific patterns. And it will start memorizing the data. And it will perform badly on the test set. And so basically, somewhere between is a balance. And uh, we'll go into how, how to find this with Notebook 4. But what's cool is if you look at the output, as we train this network, there's really two things to look at. So the first is loss. And this is the loss or the error on the training set. And lower numbers are better. So ideally, we want this to go down. The next thing to look at is the accuracy. And this is pretty much equivalent. This is the accuracy on the training set. And higher numbers are better. And so when we finish training this thing, we can see that it was about 90% accurate, which is OK. And then what we're going to do here in the last cell, or second to last cell, is we're going to see how accurate this model is on the test data. So this is data the model, this is data that wasn't used to adjust the weights in the training process. And this is the number we actually care about because it's more representative of how useful this thing is in practice. And so on the test data, it's 88%. The takeaway here, we don't really care what that number is. Uh, we can, what we care about is that the accuracy on the testing set is similar to the accuracy on the training set. And what's that? that's telling us that the model, we have a good balance in terms of, we have a reasonable size for the number of epochs. If this number on the testing set was way lower, that would have meant we overfit or we trained the model for too long. And if both the numbers were low, that means we haven't trained the model for long enough. And so literally, the way you find the right number of epochs is you run experiments. You know, you pick 
five or six different numbers, run experiments, make plots, you find the right number empirically. And we'll, we'll do that in notebook four. Quick question. Yes. Uh, so if our numbers aren't exactly the same as yours, that's because there's some kind of randomization going on? Yes, great question. So there's random initialization, and there's a couple sources of randomness. The biggest one is in the weights, which I haven't covered. But internally, the network has a large number of weights or parameters. Broadly, the way to think about a network. So machine learning means learning from data. The simplest example of learning from data is linear regression. So you have some plots, and you want to find the best fit line. You always have something called a model. And an example of a model could be y equals mx plus b. That model has two parameters that you want to learn. It has the slope and the intercept. So those are parameters you learn from data. And given your training set, you try different values. Neural networks do exactly the same thing, but inside the layers, instead of uh, M and B, we have hundreds of parameters or thousands, and we set those from the data. Those parameters all start life as random values, and there's different random initialization strategies for different reasons. But when you run this, the numbers should be similar, but not identical. So that's a great question. And then we show you some mechanics at the end of this notebook. So how do you actually use the thing to make predictions? And so in this cell, we're making predictions on all the test images. And uh, we're just showing what they look like. So if you print out the first prediction, what we're looking at, this is a list of numbers. And it's a probability distribution over all the possible labels for this image. And what you want to do, the highest one is the actual prediction you would use. And most of these are tiny. And we're just showing you here how to get the, uh, the actual prediction, which is a 9. And here's a bunch of plotting code. And what it's going to do it just takes the first 25 images from the testing set, and it will display the label in green if the network got it right, and it will display it in red if the network got it wrong. That's the end of this notebook. So basically, the, the takeaways are this. It's not a lot of code. Um, if you wanted to, what we've done here is we've written a network with a single hidden layer, and what I want to show you is, uh, One of the nice things about Keras is if we wanted to switch our design, like let's say, all right, we got whatever, 89% accuracy on the training set. Let's see if we can get higher. One of the nice things about Keras is to go to a deep neural network, we can literally just copy and paste this line. And now we have a deep neural network. So it makes it extremely easy to uh, develop and test your models. And so that's, that's a preview of what Keras can do. Uh, if you're totally new to this, Excellent, excellent, excellent API. Um, for people that have used TensorFlow before, behind the scenes, this is laying down graph level code that's, uh, this is laying down symbolic code that's being compiled, optimized, and executed behind the scenes. But one of the nice things is when you're developing with Keras, you don't need to be aware of that at all, and it feels perfectly imperative. Yeah? So there's a difference between that twice versus just putting 236. Yes. So Here's, here's what networks do when you, let's say we're, we were using a different style of network called a convolutional network. And we were classifying pictures, like cats and dogs. What happens is, the first layer learns patterns of pixels. What that means that each of these units inside the network might learn to detect different edges. The next layer learns patterns of patterns. So each of these units starts to detect textures. And our intuition breaks down, like who knows what the seventh layer is doing. But it's patterns of patterns of patterns. And so the more layers you have, you can learn more complex patterns. And the more units per layer, it's a greater number of patterns of each type. One of the horrible things about, if you're new to machine learning, neural networks are probably the worst possible model to learn first. Because there's very, we have very poor intuition for how they work. Uh, if you want to learn a lot about how they work, the very best resource I know is distill. So if you go to distill.pub, D-I-S-T-I-L-L. -L. So this is a series of researchers who do wonderful, wonderful work investigating really precisely what is actually happening inside these networks. And the very first article they have is, a, is an exploration of what are different neurons doing in image classification networks. But if you're new to machine learning, the place to start, k-nearest neighbors for sure, decision trees for sure, and really understand how those models work and then you can move sort of into the black box land of neural networks. OK, so why don't we take 10 minutes, try this notebook, 
To reset it, you can do runtime restart all and see if you can run it once as is and see if you can add another layer to the network, run it again and just compare the accuracy. Um, and try and look at the main parts of the code that are just defining the model. So we'll keep going at uh, 8.55. Oh, if you have questions, just raise your hand and we'll walk around and, and help. You said uh, first, to, you should, before neural networks, you should learn quantum control and then Oh, centuries. good question. So, uh, K nearest neighbors? K. K uh, yeah, so one sec. Um, I actually have a very old video that walks through K nearest neighbors from scratch that I don't usually plug my own content, but this is a good one. I haven't looked at this for like two years. Um, if you search for, if you go on YouTube and you search for, Machine learning recipes, I think I called it writing our first classifier. Yeah, this is real, yeah, two years now. I know this is a weird title. Look for machine learning recipes number five. And this will walk you through just in Python. So there's no libraries at all, it's just Python. Just end to end writing, your, writing a machine learning based model using something called K nearest neighbors. And the great thing about K nearest neighbors, it can classify these images, you wouldn't want to, but it could classify these images just like we have here and it uses only high school math. It's really powerful technique. After K nearest neighbors, the other thing to learn is decision trees. I have a video on this too, but if you search for decision tree, there's all sorts of tutorials. The reason I like these models is we have very, very strong natural intuition for exactly how they work. Uh, and so once you have those, then I would go to neural networks. Okay. so. Uh, Questions for the group or individual? Right. So Colab is available to everyone? Yes, Colab is available to everyone. Um, it was launched to support that machine learning crash course that I showed you. We use a very similar version of it internally to develop code. It's great. Uh, and for free? Yes, it's free. So there's some limitations. So the GPU memory is shared. So sometimes you'll, they're fast GPUs, it's shared. Colab is not appropriate for like, if you want to, train giant models, this is probably not the best solution, but it's perfect. If anyone's doing any tutoring, uh, any kind of education work on the side, if you want to give demos at work, if you want to share code so people can easily run it, you don't have to use it for machine learning, by the way. It's just, yeah, it's just Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud. It's great. And, and, and Colab supports installing other libraries? Yes, stuff. yes. Colab, you have, it's running inside a container somewhere in Google Cloud, you have root access to the container. So you can run any command you want to run, just start it with a bang, and you'll run shell commands. So it's great. Oh, great question. There's both Python 2 and 3. Uh, you can also, by the way, connect it to a local runtime and use it as an IDE. But if you go to Edit, Notebook Settings, you can swap between Python 2 and 3. So I think people need like five more minutes to work on this, so you can, you can continue doing it. But one thing I want to mention is I want to show you, um, if you're new to deep learning or you haven't used Keras before, uh, I just want to communicate like how incredibly awesome this API is relative to uh, how TensorFlow began life about two years ago. So I want to show you what the exact same code looked like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So I'm gonna to go to tensorflow.org and we're gonna go back in time. So I'm gonna hit versions at the top, maybe one one. So this is uh, version 1.1 of TensorFlow and this is the exact same program for MNIST. It happens to be MNIST and not fashion MNIST but the code is identical. And uh, I just wanna show you what, let me see if I can find this file in Python. Yeah, let's see if this link still works. Yeah. So you'll see code that looks like this. So just to input the data. So basically, actually, let me show you. I have a couple slides to show you what this looked like a long time ago. Ooh, they got reordered. So this is something that might be valuable to learn 
a very long time down the road if you have a specific reason. So you don't need to learn this now, but I just want to mention. So under the hood, uh, TensorFlow is, the word TensorFlow or ArrayFlow, you can also think of it as data flow. So behind the scenes, when you define a neural network, what you're really doing is defining a data flow graph. And your Python code is defining this graph and it gets passed to a backend, which compiles it, optimizes it, distributes it optionally, and executes it. So it's a data flow graph. And graphs, we don't have to go into them. They're great for lots of different reasons, because they're generic, they're easy to optimize, and all that jazz. So graphs are great, and we like them. Um, the problem is, when you first started writing TensorFlow, what you would do is directly write this graph. So the first version of the TensorFlow API was basically an API to define a data flow graph. And this is what the data flow, this is what the code would have looked like to add uh, two numbers. So you'll never ever have to write code like this at all if you don't want to, for a lot of reasons. But we could import TensorFlow version one, and then we want to add two numbers. So we're going to create two constants, uh, two and three, and these are nodes on the graph. And then we're creating a sum node, and when we execute sum node, it will pull down the values of its parents, add them together, and return it. But what's funny is, this, isn't, this is Python that's defining a graph. It's not actually, this is a metaprogramming language. If on line five, we just did print sum node, the output would be like TensorFlow, like addition operation, undefined value, because it hasn't actually executed. This, this code is, it's called deferred execution. To actually run the addition, you had to create something called a session. And a session uh, is an execution environment for a data flow graph. And then you say, TensorFlow, please evaluate the value of these nodes. And that will actually do the computation. And so uh, this is all behind the scenes now. And there's different ways to push it behind the scenes. So if you're on tensorflow.org and you see any code that has things like TF constant or TF placeholder or TF variable, just run away and just ignore it. And you should basically just focus on things that have tf.keras or the other APIs that I'll show you later. There's still a lot of value for this, but it comes way down the road. So this is the wrong way to learn machine learning. There's value in this when you have experience if you really want to do something low level. It's sort of the difference between assembly and Python. Like you wouldn't take a first year undergraduate and teach them assembly for a long time. Yeah? Yes, so are there examples of projects for TensorFlow uh, for not neural networks? So the truth is TensorFlow is basically for deep neural networks. It also supports things like uh, we have an implementation of gradient boosted trees, we have an implementation of random forests, uh, we have a couple mathy implementations. Oh, there's actually a giant package called TensorFlow probability. So the correct answer is yes. So the reason I was making funny faces is six months ago the website was like, no, it's for everything, it's for neural networks and also like super math. And then we're like, here's how you do the Fibonacci sequence. We now have a package called TensorFlow Probability. I'm not a statistician, but if uh, this is sort of like PhD level, here's a giant collection of really interesting stuff. Uh, it's out of my area of expertise. But if you search for TensorFlow Probability and you have a stats background, I hope it's useful. Uh, anyway. So let's, let's do this. Um, does anyone have any more questions before we keep moving? All right, let's keep moving. So we're gonna do notebook number two, which is IMDB. Before we do that, let's take two minutes, and I could use a volunteer, and this will be like a two-minute game we're gonna play, and we have a sequence of games that are gonna conclude with code you can run to build a similar version of the games we've tried now. So could I have a quick volunteer, somebody who's good at drawing things? And this is recorded, so. <laughs> Come on, sci fi. <laughs> Me too. You might you want to try it anyway? All right. Thank you for your bravery. Hey, so I'm Josh. I'm Oliver. Hi. Oliver, thanks a lot. Yes. So this is a game called Quick Draw. 
And has anyone seen this game called Quick Draw before? Yeah. So Quick Draw is awesome. So basically, it's going to ask you to draw something using my trackpad. I will do this. OK. okay. <laughs> Good luck, sir. Uh, so draw a hat. Oh, no. So you hit. OK. The hat. Like a top hat, maybe. I see line. Oh, I know. It's hat. Actually, that's great. So nicely done. So <laughs> Let's do more. Let's do one more. Oh, the sun. That's fun, by the way. I see circle, or hockey puck, or blueberry, or apple. I see cherry, or unicycle, or snowflake. <laughs> or oh, I know. It's sun. You got it. <laughs> so nice job. So thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. All right. So here's here's where I get fired. So because because we're Google, uh, we have logged your data. <laughs> so. <laughs> So on, on tensorflow.org, there's a data set uh, called QuickDraw, which contains, I think, 20 million drawings now. And they're anonymized, of course. And they're exactly like that. So it's 20 million drawings of people in 20 seconds or less trying to draw simple objects. And this is a really useful academic data set. What's interesting about these drawings is there's two ways to think of a drawing. One is it's a static picture. So you can look at the finished picture, and that's what we're doing with MNIST. A much more interesting way to think of a drawing is as a sequence. And so if you think about it, people often draw sun in a certain way. They might start by drawing a circle, and then they'll draw little lines extending from it. And there are different types of neural networks that can actually process sequences, and those are called recurrent neural networks. And uh, anyway, I'll show you a couple more variations on this game and then some code you can use at the end to train your own quick draw model. So anyway. Yes? So are we talking about the sequence of pixels or sequence of geometrical objects? Great question. It's a sequence of, are we talking about the sequence of pixels or geometric? Geometric. It's a sequence of vectors. So what the data set contains is pen positions started at these coordinates and moved to these coordinates. So it's, it's vectors. All right. So let's look at the next notebook. And this is going to be, if you go to github.com slash tensorflow slash workshops, this is going to be the IMDB. And Amit, would you like to? Yeah, thanks. So I think this is it, yeah. Cool. cool. Relax out of the. All right, hey everyone. Uh, I just had a quick question before I get started so I can kind of tailor how I give my presentation. So um, I have basically two big reasons for why you might be in this tutorial. Um, raise your hand if you kind of have an ML problem already and you have your data and you know what you want to predict, but you're just not sure how to kind of codify whatever you want to do. So if you have quite a few of you. And then how many of you just kind of want to learn the basics of TensorFlow and ML and you've heard about TensorFlow, but you just didn't know what it was? Okay, cool. So uh, a lot more of you want to learn TensorFlow. Uh, so I'll kind of like, you know, tailor a bit more towards that. So <clears throat> Josh just did a basic uh, image classification. Uh, the tutorial I'm about, to, I'm about to walk you through is going to be text classification. So uh, we're going to start off the same way. Uh, feel free to follow along. We're going to import TensorFlow, import Keras. And we're going to be working on what's called the IMDB data set. So that's basically a data set where you have a bunch of movie reviews. And their tag, the, the, the label is basically a one or a zero. One being very positive, zero being like negative, or like, yeah, a negative review. So let's download the data set. If you notice, I'm providing the num words argument. So that's basically going to truncate the amount of separate words that we care about to 10,000. So any word after, like, let's say the 15,000th most popular word, we're just going to treat it as we're just going to bucketize all the remaining words. That's all that means. So let's, look at, let's take a quick look at the data. So we have 25,000 training entries. And let's print the first training entry. So as you can see, it's just basically a list of numbers. Each of the numbers represents a word. Can everyone hear me OK? So one problem that you can immediately think of is that the, each review is of a different length. Like as we see right here, uh, one is 218, one is 189. And neural networks 
kind of want standardized format. So what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pad each of the uh, reviews and either truncate them at 256 or pad them to 256, and I'll do that in a second. First, let's uh, convert the integer back to words. This is not helpful for the actual machine learning portion of the tutorial, it's just so we can kind of better grasp how the data is formatted. So we're gonna download the reverse dictionary and then we have a basic function called decode review. And this is what a review looks like. So we have like a start character or a start word and then a bunch of uh, like actual words. So here is where we're gonna pad the data. So we're gonna use something called pad sequences. Uh, if you ever have any issues with uh, kind of, you wanna know what, uh, what, um, a function is doing, the, doc the documentation on TensorFlow is fantastic and Keras as well. So you just Google the string and then um, you can just find it like in the TensorFlow docs and they're versioned as well. So uh, as 1.9 comes out, we'll have a 1.9 version, but that's just how to figure out what any function is doing. So here we go, I'm gonna pad the, uh, the data sets, okay. So now, we expect each of these to be 256. And now when we look at the first uh, review again, we're gonna see a bunch of numbers and we're gonna see zeros padded at the end, which is kind of what we specified to pad with. Word index with the index pad, which is zero over here. Everyone following along so far? All right, cool, looks like it. So now we're gonna build the model. And, yes? The, uh, the indices that you use, 0, 1, 2, 3, were already reserved, or did you re-reserve them and move all the indices out? So good question. So the way that the data was formatted was that the, they were reserved, and so we've now created our own word index where, like, in, in this dictionary, we kind of uh, give these values to those indices. But that was how it was formatted. And then, once again, if you look up the data set, and go to the docs, it'll show you why those are separated out, yeah. Good question. Cool, so now we're gonna build the model. Uh, our vocab size is 10,000, so that's all that is, that's, I'll keep that aside for now. Um, as Josh mentioned, we're gonna build these uh, layers on the fly using sequential. So we're gonna, you're gonna notice, uh, I believe Josh's tutorial only had dense layers. We're gonna have two separate layers um, that you might not have seen before. The first one is an embedding layer. So what that's basically doing is it's adding a new dimension to our, um, to our data that we're gonna be feeding in. And then the global average pooling layer is just gonna be averaging that um, across, the new, uh, across the new dimension that we have, essentially. Um, we can go into more specifics later. Uh, one, kind, one thing to kind of keep in mind when you're doing uh, ML for the first time is not to get too involved into the math and into the weeds of what each layer is doing. And I know as engineers that's really difficult because you know we're programmed to understand exactly what's happening behind the scenes. But for learning for right now, I suggest kind of just stepping back and just trusting that the models that we that you see are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and then just looking up the docs and then kind of getting a high level understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. Actually, yeah. So that's. So, so that's, that's exactly right, and that's a really, really good point. So, excellent, excellent point. So the goal of these networks, the goal of these tutorials is not to be, let's understand exactly how the dense layer works, or let's understand exactly what the global average pooling 1D is doing. Not important. What's important when you're learning ML is the flow. And the flow is import a data set, understand the format of the data, define a model, and that's the black box, the black box portion of today. How the model works is black box, but how you train it, how you evaluate it, how you make predictions is what you want to walk away with. Yeah, rather than walking away with exactly how the embedding layer works, I, I think it would be better to know that, hey, if I have a text classification problem, I should start with an embedding, then a global average, and then feed it into dense layers. So, question? You know, you're adding layers, but you're using different syntax. So I was wondering, is it the same thing, or is, are you doing something different? Yes, so we are doing something different. So uh, in, that, in the previous tutorial, we only added dense layers, right? Now we're adding a, um, an embedding layer and a global average pooling layer. 
So if you want to find out more about that, um, you can always like look refer to the documentation. But you you are correct. Like the the layers are a bit different this this time. We have two new layers that you haven't seen before, and like I said before, the embedding is just adding a new dimension, and then the global average pooling is just going to be averaging over the previous dimension that we're cutting out, and I can go over that in more detail later on but there's a lot going on there that i don't want i want to gloss over really quickly while we're building these layers while we're building the model cool so let's run this you're going to get a nice model summary kind of capturing exactly what's happening and here's some more information about the uh, layers if you want to read more into that so as josh mentioned there are three stages to creating a model first you like create the layers then we compile it. So it's, compiling is just done in one step. Uh, as Josh mentioned, you know, if you're new, just use the Atom Optimizer. It's awesome. Uh, there are a bunch of different optimizers that you can use, each with their own paper, if you really want to like get more into the weeds on that. Uh, our loss function is a bit different this time. Since we're using uh, just two outputs now, 0 or 1, we don't need a categorical cross-entropy function. We just need a binary cross-entropy function, loss function. And we're going to keep track of the accuracy as well. Cool. So we've compiled our model. Um, I'm not sure if we did this in the Fashion MNIST tutorial. We're going to create what's called a validation data set. So there's three types of data sets, essentially. There's training, which is what we're going to learn with and learn on. There's validation, which is part of the training, usually. We're just going to keep validating our model um, and kind of mimic the test set. And then the test set is exactly what you test on in finality or when everything is done. Once you get your test set numbers, that's it. You don't want to keep training on that because then you've essentially contaminated your test set. So that's a concept that um, in, case we, in case you haven't like, heard of it, that's really important to know uh, just for ML in general. So I'm going to make the validation the last 10,000 of the 25,000. All right, so here we're going to train the model. Uh, we're going to provide the uh, X training and the Y training, which are just the reviews and the labels. Uh, we're going to train for 40 epochs, which is a bit longer than we've trained before. We're going to provide a batch size of 512. So we're going to be evaluating 512 reviews at once. And the validation data sets are over here. So we're just going to train. This is going to take a while. Keep in mind we're running uh, throughout the entire training data set, and we're going to do that 40 times. That's what 40 epochs means. You're going to notice our loss is slowly going down. Our accuracy is increasing. And our validation accuracy is just trailing a little bit, which is expected, because we're, tra we're learning about the training accuracy, and we're just evaluating our validation accuracy. Does anyone have any questions on the difference between training and validation? So why I chose 40 epochs? Yeah. Um, once again, that was just random. Like you, you might find that if you only train for 10 epochs, you might, not, you might only get to 60% accuracy. And if you train for 50 or like 100, you're going to overfit. So I'll go back into that. Just table your question. I'll answer that in just a second. Good question. Yes? Um, you, we, can com we can compare the losses, but accuracy is just uh, easier for like, you to grasp in the sense of being like, you know exactly what it means. Like in, if you saw 100 reviews and you have 89% accuracy, you were um, like right 89% of the times whether it was positive or negative. But loss is more hard. It's, it's just a theoretical metric. It's harder to kind of understand exactly what it means. So that's why I'm comparing them. But yeah, you can, like, you can decide to stop training based on your loss. So um, usually they go hand in hand. But yeah. They're not necessarily. They don't have like one. The no, they the loss and the train the the loss and the accuracy do not add up to one. Uh, loss is just basically a mathematical way of saying how off we are, and accuracy is just given the five twelve how accurate we are. Yes. So maybe I missed this, but uh, how did you decide that in the previous model you just directly did, uh, directly went to the 
so that comes with practice. Um, do you have? Yeah, that's exactly. Go. Yeah, so that comes with practice essentially. So um, we, you could actually theoretically feed this directly into a dense layer. We just kind of want to show that with text classification, you, you can do um, different stuff. But that, that's an intuition that just comes with practice uh, and kind of seeing different models. So like seeing another text classification model and saying, oh, they started with this layer. Let me try that. And you might find that some techniques that you're using will get you better performance than what we're teaching you. Yeah. yeah so one thing, can I add to that real quick? So that's, that's exactly right. So another reason we used an embedding uh, layers for memory efficiency. Um, so this notebook was inspired by a book called Deep Learning with Python. And if you search for Deep Learning with Python, there are many books by this name, but the one true book is the one by the author of Keras. And this notebook is very, very similar to one you can find on GitHub called Classifying Movie Reviews that does actually solve this problem just using dense, dense layers. Uh, but it's much, much less efficient. And it has to do for uh, how much memory you have to take up to represent all the words as vectors. And embedding is a way to uh, compress that greatly. Mm -hmm. Cool, so uh, our model is done training. Yes, question. It's a completely uh, independent uh, evaluation. That that information is not going back to into the model input. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why was the what was the concern about using So um the tr <clears throat> so let me clarify again. The training accuracy and or the training loss we are using to kind of tune the model uh, using some really advanced calculus. Uh, the validation loss and accuracy we, it's just for us. It's just to, it's just to mimic the test set. The test set is kind of completely separate and your final evaluation. See, right now, if I notice my validation accuracy is low, I can increase or decrease the amount of epochs and keep training. But you can't do that in the real world, right? So the test set is basically your one shot try, yeah. Cool, so I'm gonna move on. All right, now we're gonna evaluate the model. So um, our we ran the model on our test um, data, so we can't train anymore after this if we want to actually utilize these as our test metrics. So our test accuracy is around 87.5%, which is fairly close to our validation accuracy. Our training accuracy, as you can see, is 94%, which is much higher. Um, and this basically means that we've overfit, and I'll get to that in a second. One great thing about using Keras is that it keeps a keeps track of all the metrics over the amount of epochs in something called a history object. So um, we're gonna plot the history using matplotlib. So as you can see over here, our training loss, which is represented by the dots, gets lower and lower, but our validation loss slowly stops like decreasing. And that essentially means that we're finding patterns in our training data that aren't necessarily there. So that means you're overfitting. So that means maybe your training data just happened to have some pattern that you didn't know about, and you're generalizing and uh, applying that pattern to the entire, to anything that your model sees, which is obviously bad. Which is why it's really important to get like randomly distributed and like um, like d training data. A lot of a lot of ML is getting good training data. Yes. Yes, because we weren't training and we weren't learning on the validation. Like I said, mentioned before, it was a completely independent metric. So if my training numbers are higher than validation, I can safely make the assumption that I'm looking at patterns that aren't there. So we took the last 10,000 as your validation set. So if, the, if it wasn't randomly distributed, that would be like the original data. Yeah, yes. Uh, so we, we, it, was, it is randomly distributed in the data set, so I didn't need to randomly shuffle, but uh, TF.dataset offers, if, if your data is from your own thing and you want to like randomly just like, like randomly shuffle it, TF.dataset has great APIs for doing that. Yeah. 
So over here, once again, you can see that um, the training accuracy is rapidly increasing, but the uh, validation accuracy isn't. And so one way to avoid overfitting is that um, maybe we could have just stopped training after Epoch 20, and then uh, our, <clears throat> our model would be better able to generalize rather than overfitting to our training set. Uh, overfitting and underfitting are very common problems, and there are a bunch of techniques to kind of combat them. I'm not sure if we're going into this. Uh, oh, we'll? Okay, perfect. So gonna be, there's going to be a great tutorial later that kind of deals with some more mathy approaches of how to uh, combat overfitting and underfitting, because those are problems that any, anyone studying and practicing ML will face. So yeah. So yeah, that's uh, the basic gist of text classification. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, I think right now it's just uh, the validation, loss, validation, accuracy, and training, loss, and training accuracy. Yeah, it's just a dictionary of those objects over time. And then um, this is like the best way to plot, plot them, yeah. Yes. Oh, good point. Yes, you were right. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Is your training for different epochs? Is it possible to get caught at a local minimum? And how does that? How would the model handle that? Would it just keep? Would it just stuck there? Would it just keep? Would it stop? Or would it just keep showing the same accuracy and fall? In in theory, it's definitely possible. Um, it, it, it could happen that you know you keep adjusting the weights, keep tuning the weights, and then all of a sudden you get a big change in weights after maybe five epochs of like stability. And I, as you can see, that's kind of happening a little bit. But yeah, that is possible. It also all depends on the random initialization of the weights and your training data. But yeah, that's theoretically possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any significance to that with the binary classification? I mean, does that basically mean you're like flipping a coin? Well, once again, it, that's loss, not accuracy. So the loss is just a metric that's kind of um, like, it's just a numeric representation. It doesn't mean that, oh, we're just at a coin flip. If, if the accuracy were 50%, okay. exactly, then you essentially know that you're only classifying one thing you're always saying that it's like positive or negative, and then obviously you're gonna be 50% wrong. So yeah, uh, key distinction though, like that's a good question to note that the difference between loss and accuracy. The loss is not based out of one or anything, yeah. Cool, uh, one last anecdote real quick, if any of this seems like a little intimidating. Um, so when I learned TensorFlow, uh, I just wanted to do a very basic linear regression and all I wanted to do was, I took a bunch of lines in Excel and I wanted to plot the, the, I wanted to basically reverse engineer the points to a line. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. So the guy who sat next to me, he was uh, training this really complicated like s convolutional neural network on ResNet with a bunch of GPUs. So I was like, all right, if anyone knows, it's gonna be this guy. So I go over to him and I say, hey, can you help me with this basic linear regression? He takes a look and he looks at me and he says, I can help you classify ResNet with eight GPUs. I can't help you do a basic linear regression. <laughs> so my, my point of the story, or moral of the story, is that TensorFlow is a huge library, and it's almost impossible to know exactly what every single API does. Even I, I by no means, am an expert on all of it or even any of it. But the documentation is great, and uh, the community is really great. So feel free, please ask questions on Stack Overflow, GitHub. Uh, my team and I will be sure to get to you soon. Thank you. So really nice job. I just want to summarize one or two takeaways also. So a huge, huge thing in this notebook that wasn't in the first one is the validation set. 
there's lots of questions on this. So here's, here's the basic idea. You can kind of think of when you're training a model, whether you're using a neural network or anything else in machine learning, is imagine you're going to Vegas. And in Vegas, you get to use your model exactly once. And the higher your accuracy on the test set, the more money you get. The lower it is, the more money you pay. So to start your experiments, you always have training data, and this is the only data you ever get to work with. And your friend Rachel, who owns the casino in Vegas, she has your test set. And you never ever get to see it until you literally show up at the casino, give your model to Rachel, and she runs it on the test set. So the test data is gone. So what you do is, when you're developing your model, you need to find the right value for things called hyperparameters. Hyperparameter is a fancy word from a parameter you define when you train your model. And there's lots of them. How many layers you should use is a hyperparameter. How many epochs you train for is a hyperparameter. And that's the main one. So you have to find a good value for that. The way you do that is you take your training set and you pull some data off of it called your validation data. And another word for validation data is dummy test data. And so you pretend that your validation data is the test data. You train a model and you evaluate the accuracy on the validation set, you make plots, and you use that to find good values for epochs. Then you give your code to Rachel, she runs it, and you find out how well you did. So that's, that's the experiment that we're simulating. And it's, yeah, super, super important. And uh, yeah, that's the main takeaway. So why don't we take 10 minutes, try and run through this code, poke around with it, um, look at the plots, and uh, then let's take a break for, here, let me get the timing. So I'll tell you what, let's start again at 9.45, so that's 15 minutes. So use as much of that time as you want to poke around with this notebook or get some coffee, and then we'll start again at 9.45, we'll do a couple more notebooks, play some more games, and continue onward uh, from there. Oh, and if you have questions, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll come around. Okay, let's get started again. So we're gonna do another quick game. So I need a volunteer who can also draw, but this one's a little bit more complicated than the last drawing one. So this person will need to draw a duck. Then there's a reason for this. Come on down, yeah, thank you, yeah. So there is a project in TensorFlow called Magenta. And if you go to Magenta, dot tensorflow, what the hell? magenta.tensorflow.org slash demos, or just search for TensorFlow Magenta. Hey, I'm Josh. Hi, hey, thanks for your help. So this is a giant research project, super amazing, and they study deep learning for art and music. And so uh, given that we have this data set of 20 million uh, images, that are 20 million vector sequences of people trying to draw uh, things like ducks, can we actually use that to build drawing auto suggest? Um, so let me show you what this looks like. So there's one such demo called Sketch RNN. And Sketch RNN is drawing autocomplete for all the different objects that people have drawn in QuickDraw. So if you wouldn't mind, and if you click and hold and start drawing a duck, and you can draw as much of the duck as you like. Okay, and then Magenta is going to try to autocomplete your duck. <laughs> like, oh, that's awful. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> so sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. But what, we can try again too. <laughs> uh, clear? But what's, yeah, if you hit clear, we can try it again. <laughs> Oh, nice. Okay, now let's see what happened. <laughs> Hold on, I'll tell you what. Let's, eh, let's try again. <laughs> see how you drew the first part of the duck with the yeah, beak? Yeah. That was smart. Let's try it again. If you just draw the beak and the head. Uh, it just, it yeah, my mouse is a little funny. Okay, great. Now let's see what happens. Uh, okay. It's trying. <laughs> It's not terrible, so let me try this too. Because I've used magenta a lot, I happen to know that if you draw a beak and, well, I suck. If you draw a beak and a head, all right, that wasn't any better. But, 
So thanks very much. So, <laughs> so as crappy as this is, it's also super, super cool. Because if you think about the complexity involved of the network understanding that if somebody draws a circle, they've started drawing the body of the duck. Or if they've drawn a beak like this, they've started drawing the, the beak. And it knows ducks have eyes and legs. And so what's cool is there's autocomplete models for all the objects that uh, are in QuickDraw. And the complete code uh, to train uh, this sketch RNN is published on the website. It's a little bit beefy, but it's, uh, it's super, super cool. But it's, it's just a great example. Anyway. All right, so let's look at notebook three. And this is going to be for structured data prediction. So if you click on housing prices, So there's two big differences with this notebooks and the previous ones that we've been working with. The first is this is for regression. So broadly, there are two big categories of machine learning. Classification, predict a thing. Regression, predict a number. And that number can be a price or a probability or anything you like. The more interesting difference, the other two notebooks worked with high dimensional data. And what I mean by that are images and text. So People, when we look at all the pixels from an image, it doesn't mean much to us. We have to zoom out to get intuition. So it's high dimensional data. Even those tiny little MNIST images have 784 pixels, and any single pixel doesn't tell us a lot about the image. Text also, you know, there's 10,000 words. Any individual word usually doesn't tell us that much about the sentence. This is structured data, though. So here, we're working with a data set, and our goal is to predict the price of a house in Boston and this is an old academic data set from the 1970s. It's small, there's just a couple hundred examples. But it has 13 different features or columns in the data set. So this is a spreadsheet or a CSV file. And the difference with the other notebooks is each of these features tells us a lot about the problem because they're engineered by people and they're human meaningful. So a really strong feature for the price of a house would be how many floors does it have? What's the square feet? How many bathrooms? Is it near a really fancy college? These things tell us a lot about the domain. And so where deep learning really, really shines is when you're working with high dimensional data, images, text, sound, sequences. It's also good for structured data like this. And in business situations, like if you're working at a financial company, you'll probably have an enormous amount of data in your database of this form. Um, and you can also use deep learning to work on this too. And so here what we'll do is demonstrate how to train a TensorFlow model to predict the price of a house in Boston in the 1970s based on this particular data set. And the flow is very, very similar to the other notebooks. It's just a different type of data. Um, so it's a useful skill in practice. Uh, what's cool about these is you'll start to get the pattern of how to do these uh, little experiments in TensorFlow pretty quick. Um, because these notebooks, it's different data, but the flow is very similar. So as before, we're importing the data set. It comes pre-divided into train and test. We're taking a look at the format. So this is extremely small. So this is not enough data uh, to train an accurate TensorFlow model. And how much data you need always depends on the data set and the domain you're working in. I happen to know this isn't enough because I've done some experiments with this. Um, but this is enough for us to demonstrate the workflow. Usually, a question you'll get a lot or I get a lot, or you'll get a lot when you start working with ML, is how much data do I need for your problem? And the answer is always, more is always better. And over time, you'll develop intuition for the right number of examples uh, for a particular problem. Here, I'd want to see 10,000 examples, ballpark. Uh, maybe 100 examples for every feature that we have, minimum. And here, we just have way less than that. So, when you start working with structured data, there's different things you want to do. The first thing you'd want to do is, uh, here we'll look, actually, I'll tell you what. Let me show you something much cooler. So I'll come back to this notebook in a moment. There's a really useful tool. tool. If you search for facets, F-A-C-E-T-S, Google Research, and we'll link to this from that notebook when we update it later. This is a really valuable tool for basically visualizing spreadsheets. 
And so if you scroll down, there's a demo that's preloaded. And this is a data set. It's a structured data set. So it's a CSV file from the 1990 US Census. And what this is, it describes, I think it's a subset. So there's like 50,000 people here. And each dot is a person. And if you click on a dot, you'll see the, uh, you'll see the row in the spreadsheet that represents them. So this particular person is 31. They live in the US, probably all of them. This must mean country of birth, not current residence. Did they report capital gains? Jazz like that. Are they working full time or not? And um, this particular data set, we want to predict if somebody is making more or less than $50,000 a year. And so this is 1990. So in this data set, the blue dots are people making less than 50,000, and the red dots are people making more. And the reason I'm showing you this tool is when you think about a problem like this where you're collecting features, you want to think about what features we have to work with, and your intuition really counts a lot, which features are meaningful and which features are not. Because almost always for structured data, you'll be collecting your own data set or involved with creating it. So if we think about it, age is usually a pretty predictive feature of income, meaning people under 18 are extremely unlikely to be making a ton of money. And so what we can do, we can facet or bucket uh, the data set by age. And so now we're looking at age buckets. And if you look at 17 to 24, it's almost all blue. And you see adults later in their working careers tend to have a little bit of a higher percentage, and then in retirement dips a little bit. Other features you could think of are education is pretty important. So we would, not always, but on average, people with a master's degree tend to make more than people with only a high school degree. And what other things you can do that are interesting in facets is you can facet by multiple things at once. So we could facet by education, mm, that's not a great one. I mean, this is, some features are gonna be super, super predictive. So here we're bucketing by people that reported capital gains and education. And if we look at some of these, I don't know. There's gonna be certain combinations of features that are super, super important. So what's cool about facets, and the reason I'm showing it to you, is it has this upload your data thing. And you can upload a CSV file, and it will visualize it for you. So it's a great way to just poke around your data and explore it. It's good for presentations. Excuse me? Yes? What's the URL? Oh, uh, it's weird. But if you search for facets Google research. Are you trying to search for it? Oh, uh, include the phrase pair, P-A-I-R. Here, I'll, I'll project the URL. It's just a useful tool. It's super useful. The reason I'm showing you this before I go in the notebook is almost always with structured data, it's not like, hey, I have some toy data set. It's, you know, I'm collecting my own. Uh, anyway, for this notebook, we already have a data set. And what we're doing is we're just visualizing it in pandas, so it's a CSV file. Uh, each row is an example, and each column is a feature. And here we have the labels, or the target that we're trying to predict as a separate object, as always. And these are in thousands of dollars. So would have been good for us to buy houses in the 70s. Um, other things we're doing is we're putting all these features on the same, uh, we're normalizing all the features. So we're subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. So at this point, we have vectors that can be fed into our neural network as always. So the next thing we need to do is define a model. So there's a couple small differences um, with before. I think I'm gonna change this notebook a little bit. So one difference is we're using a different optimizer. Uh, the only reason we're using a different optimizer here, I'm gonna actually get rid of it. Uh, I would just use Atom. You can use a different optimizer. Here, another thing is we're specifying the learning rate. So optimizers actually have a whole bunch of parameters. 
Almost always, and this is one of the things I like so much about using Keras, is it has something called good defaults. Meaning, if you just don't specify the parameters, usually it has the behavior that you want. Actually, you might have to specify them here because this is, uh, we're using a TensorFlow optimizer. Close enough. Uh, the loss function we're looking at is mean squared error. This is a good loss function for regression. So what we want to minimize is the square difference between the price of the house we predict and the actual price of the house. And that just means that we're penalizing large, uh, large mistakes are penalized more than small mistakes. As before, it's, it's a fully connected dense network. Again, as always, we've found these numbers of units experimentally. So literally try a bunch of different designs with the network, make plots, compare the uh, performance on the training and testing set. Yes? Great question. So why are we using powers of two for the number of units? So uh, yeah, that's for numeric efficiency. So efficiency is a whole topic. Uh, what happens is ultimately we're, with larger models, we'd want to run them on an accelerator like a GPU. GPUs have a certain amount of memory, and usually it's much, much smaller than system memory. And so there's different trade-offs to make between you want your model to fit in memory, and then you're also copying data back and forth between system memory and the GPU, and you want to find efficient values for all these. But uh, to answer your question, this doesn't have to be power of two. This can be 99 or whatever you want. I think it's just because these are numbers that are familiar to us. It also could be that we might want to do a search for the right number, and so we're just using powers of two. Also, by the way, to be aware of, don't, don't get stuck. So this is sort of a, this is a black hole so first of all, there's no right answer. So there are many possible designs for this network that will perform equally well. So don't get sucked into, a lot of students, um, when they first start learning about deep learning, they'll focus all their time on defining the model. And this is one of the least important parts because it's something that's perfectly encapsulated. What you should spend your time on is understanding the data, setting up your experiments, that's basically thinking carefully about train, validate, test, think about how your network's gonna be used, how you use it in practice, all that matters much more, because you can come back to this later and try different designs. Uh, what we're doing here, so before we were training for a very small number of epochs, like 20. Here we're training for 500, and the reason is that this is a really, really, really tiny data set. And so, uh, What we're doing is, as always, we're making these plots of our loss on the train and validation data. So here's one useful technique. So when you're training these models, you always need to figure out how long should I train the model for and when should I stop? A good to prevent overfitting. A good strategy to determine your stopping point is to stop training your model when the loss on the validation data is no longer decreasing. So you train until the loss on the validation data stops decreasing. And in this particular notebook, that happens pretty early. So we're reaching close to our minimum loss around here. There's a way to do this automatically. So what I recommend doing for your own experiments, I would literally make plots like this and just look at them. There's value into making these plots. Debugging is a big one. But you can also do this automatically. So here in our model.fit method, we can also provide a callback. And this is a callback called early stopping. And this will tell the model to track the validation loss over time and stop training when it stops decreasing for a certain number of epochs. And there's a parameter for that called patience. And so here, if it hasn't gone down for 20 epochs, it will just abort the training process. And this is just to save us time. And so here it stopped training after about 150 epochs. <clears throat> Another thing we can do is, because this is regression, we can actually look at our average error over the entire data set. And so on average, we're off by about $2,700 on the price of a house. And then the last part of the notebook shows you how to make predictions on individual houses, where you're predicting the price. Um, 
This notebook I actually personally don't like as much as the other ones. It's useful. The reason I don't like it so much is this data set is, we're gonna do some work on this. There's more you can do with structured data. So when you're working with structured data, there are lots of important questions that you wanna ask. One such important question is which features are important? So often uh, you really wanna know like of the Structured data is it's one of the few chunks of machine learning that you can actually look at the features that are being input to the model and try and understand which are valuable and which are not. And this is really, really important because usually what you don't want is a black box model that just tells you the price of a house. You want to understand what's happening so you can use that to make business decisions or so you can think about additional features you can add to the model. There's different ways to do that. Decision trees are a great way to understand your data. So if you train a decision tree, if you use scikit-learn, you train a decision tree on this data, it will show you a tree which describes exactly which features the model looks at and in what order. And that has enormous value just looking at. The model that is spit out by the network might end up having slightly higher accuracy if you train on an enormous amount of data. But I would do a tree first to understand what is happening and why. And there's a lot of value in this. This is more of a FYI. If you wanted to train a much more, if you wanted to use deep learning on structured data, we have a different tutorial, which I'd recommend over this one. The problem is it uses a different API, which I like less than tf.keras. But if you search for TensorFlow wide and deep, so TensorFlow wide and deep is a tutorial we have on tensorflow.org that goes into structured data classification using that census data set that I showed you earlier. Um, and it looks at, it has tons of utilities to look at different combinations of features and see how that affects the performance of the model. So this is a much better tutorial for structured data than uh, predicting housing prices. Anyway, just to get the flow of things. Just, um, this tutorial that went through this, I'll turn the GPU on it, uh, error solved. Thank you, I'll have to take a look at that. Do you know what error you get? Nice, I'll, I'll come over and check it out, thanks. Um, yeah, so I take five minutes, go over this, see if you can run it, predict some housing prices just to get a sense of the flow, and then we'll look at notebook number four, which I think is much more valuable, because that teaches overfitting and underfitting, which is a super good concept to know. By the way, it's also important to understand if you look at these graphs, you'll notice that they're not smooth. And it's important to think about why these graphs are not smooth. So let's look at the training data for starters, which is in blue. So you saw a parameter for learning rate earlier in the network. Basically, when you're training a network, what it's doing is it's making small adjustments to the weights at every iteration. And the size of the adjustment that it makes to the weight is scaled by the learning rate. Higher learning rates means it makes larger adjustments meaning hopefully it converges faster. But with too high of an adjustment, your loss can actually start increasing again because you've, you've moved too far in the wrong direction. And the reason this is bumpy, it's issues with the learning rate. If we used a really, really tiny learning rate, the model would train slower, but this would be much smoother, usually decreasing. It's bouncing up a little bit just from learning rate problems. The reason the validation loss is super bumpy is basically we're it's bumpy and it's bouncing up again because we're beginning to overfit. So at every iteration, we're testing this data on the validation set. And although we're, we're optimizing it using the training data, and so the performance on the validation data varies depending on our parameters. And so that's, that's why that's bumpy. I have a question. Yeah. How important is the normalization of your data? 
Extremely. So the question was, how important is it to normalize your data? So if your data are not normally distributed, then here's why. A mean and dividing by standard deviation isn't necessarily the best. Yeah, there could be more sophisticated strategies to normalize it. So the reason that it's important to stick your data on small scales, basically, every unit inside a dense layer in a network. What a single unit is doing is it's taking a linear combination of the inputs, each of which has a learned weight. So every feature from your data set, let's say number of, let's say the square foot of the house, is literally multiplied by a number. And so the problem is, uh, if you're, as you scale that number, you get much larger or smaller impacts depending on the scale of the feature. And if you put them all on the same scale, like between negative one and one or zero and one, it makes it easier for the network to learn similar size weights. Right, so all the weights are of the same order of magnitude. That's, yeah, exactly. So let's work on this for about five minutes, then we'll do overfitting under fitting. Yeah? When you normalize between like zero and one, does that cause limitations on like, would it, the model be less likely to give you outputs that are going to be beyond the range of your normalized data? Like if it were to be abnormal? So great question. So uh, can the model give you outputs beyond the range of your data? And the answer is yes. So a regression model can predict, yes, you can get huge ranges, and that's a problem. How well does it extrapolate? Uh, so how well does it extrapolate? So the answer is models, will, the most important thing is your data set. So to train more accurate models, always, always, always more data. In the special case of working with structured data, it's how thoughtful are your features. So the network only gets to look at features which we've engineered. So if we're giving it things like Square foot of the house, number of bathrooms, distance in miles to a fancy school, those are all very informative. If we give it uninformative features, like what's the color of the roof, or like, you know, that tells us a lot less. So how thoughtful are your features? Quantity of data, thoughtfulness of features, properly designed experiment. After those three, it's, is the model architecture sufficient to learn the data? In practice, when you're doing ML, 95% of your work goes into data collection, data cleaning, and feature engineering for structured data. A much smaller amount of work goes into building the model. Uh, a question about the uh, money rate. Uh, I'm just wondering why and all the kinds of low implement uh, causes like uh, adaptive money rate. Say Great question. Great question. So uh, the question was, why can't the learning rate be adaptive? And the answer is, it is. So by default, Adam will use an adaptive learning rate. So that's why we like Adam, one of the reasons. That's exactly right. Yes? So what about your code makes it a regression model? The fact that you're using MSC loss? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Thank you. Yep, so what about the code makes it a regression layer, a regression model? So the loss is mean squared error. And we haven't gone into network design. But if you look at the very last, if you look at the lowest layer of the network, so the output is a dense layer with one unit. And what that literally means is this will be some number that ranges between negative infinity and positive infinity. It's just a single number. And that number is the output of the network. And what we do is we compare the output of that number to the squared error of what it should have predicted. We can constrain the value of this. So let's say we were doing uh, we were doing a regression model, but we wanted to predict a probability instead of an unbounded number. What we would do is just say activation equals tf.nn.sigmoid. And what that will do is that will squash that value to a range. But with no activation, it's unbounded. Are there other bounds that you can specify by custom functions? Yes. You can write a custom activation function. So. All of these are just functions. Uh, you could implement one in tf.keras, or if you look at notebook number five, you can do one with eager, and it's much easier. In general, I'd steer you away from that. But yes, you can. Yeah. Yes? So back to question, the word normalize can be tricky in this context because it has multiple meanings. So it can mean scaling, because it's one to one, or it can mean a Gaussian distribution. So assuming that you meant the Gaussian distribution, how important is that distribution of data? Thank you, excellent question. So you just brought up uh, what you said, just to repeat it, is the word normalize can mean different things in different contexts. So you'd be talking about normalizing, standardizing, what kinds of distributions? It depends on the problem. In general, networks are happy when your data ranges between negative one and one or zero and one. And it's consistent throughout all your features, if possible. Um, 
for your particular problem, I would think about what types of distributions make the most sense. But I'd say that's domain dependent. But it's a great question. And answering stuff like that is exactly where you spend a lot of your time for your different problems. So uh, just to compare, like if you think about uh, Properly normalizing your data, whatever that means for your problem, is much more valuable than spending that same time tweaking the number of layers in your model, like massively. Yeah, good data, good features, and a lot of data will, and a simple model will always, always beat uh, a lot of data, crappy features, and a complicated model. In the previous example, we explicitly made a validation set. Here, we're calling validation split. Um, is there a difference between those two? Yeah, great question. So, and is that if it's if the split is it the same set each? Ah, time? so here basically a giant caveat about this. I think I'm going to change this notebook a lot. This is not showing best ML practices. Um, the previous notebook was. What we're doing here is I'd have to read this code more carefully. But what we're doing when we're this is convenience when we're training the model. What we're asking TensorFlow to do is take 20 percent of our training data, and I'm actually not sure if this is consistent across that box or if it's different every time. I'd have to check. And it's using that to validate the model as we go. This is purely for convenience. You know, once you have a model that's uh, trained and you're happy with it, can you invert it? And can you, you know, ask a different question about it? So interesting question. So when you have a model that's trained, can you use it to ask different questions? So the answer is yes in special cases. Um, so there's a field of ML called transfer learning. And uh, it, the best example we have is for image classification. So let's say we trained, there's a common data set in ML called ImageNet. And ImageNet has you know, a million images and a thousand different classes, so cats, dogs, flowers. And a common task is, given that we've trained a model on ImageNet, can we customize it to work with new images? And there's different ways of doing that, but yes. What if you have a, uh, a network that, you know, And so you have uh, um, different colors going into the uh, neural network, and then you've got one color coming out. Can you, and once you have that neural network trained, can then you invert it and say, well, I want this color, oh. so do, what do I have to put into the front end? Great question. So uh, the question was, can you invert a network? So let's say in this case, we're going from a CSV file of housing prices to a number. Can we go from a number to the, uh, maybe. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. We'd have to talk offline a little bit. Interesting question, though. We could go into GANs, but yes, it's a great question. But we'll punt on that for right now. So let's spend five minutes, let's go over this. Uh, then we'll do one more game. We'll go into overfitting, underfitting, which is super, super valuable to understand. And then we'll go into some more advanced uh, notebooks. All right, if everyone's ready, we can get started with the next notebook. <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, overfitting and underfitting are problems you're going to see a lot uh, whenever you do any sort of ML. So we're going to figure out a few ways to combat those using some math approaches. Um, I'll try to stay more on the API side rather than dive deep into the math, but uh, it'll be natural if you have a lot of questions. So we're going to look at the IMDB data set again. This time we're going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, I think I had a question about this. We're going to use one hot encoding which is basically uh, we have each, earlier we represented each review as a list of numbers based on which word uh, popped up. Now we're going to be representing them as, since we have 10,000 possible words, uh, an, er, a vector of, zero, of length 10,000 with, if any, if the index of, if a word appears, the index of that word will be one. So let's say word number 250 appears uh, the 250th index is going to be 1 on that 10,000 uh, length vector. So uh, you don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, just follow along because uh, we'll be, I'll be mostly spending time on how to like reduce the overfitting and underfitting. So um, over here we download the data set again. I've, I, I won't be running through this because it takes a lot of time. And then this is kind of what one uh, vector will look like. As you can see, the more popular words are all very like all seen, we have one word that's like 7,500 over here. Um, so that's gonna be how we represent the reviews now. 
So we're going to be making three different models. We're going to be making a uh, baseline model. So that's going to, if you notice, we, we got rid of the first embedding in the max pooling layer. So we're now feeding it directly into dense layers, as I mentioned earlier, which is possible for us to do. So the baseline model is going to have 16 units in the, or hidden units in each layer. And we're going to use the atom optimizer again. We're going to use binary cross entropy loss. Um, and then we're going to make, we're going to plot that over 20 epochs. We're going to make a smaller model with only four units. And we're going to make a bigger model with 512. So uh, the same amount of epochs for each one, the same function, same optimizer, everything. The only difference is we'll have four units, uh, 16 units, and 512 units. So let's see how they perform. So this is what the output's going to look like. Um, let's talk about the loss first. So the loss are the solid lines, not the dashed lines. Um, you see that the green model, which only has four units uh, in each layer, is struggling to really lower the loss. But the larger, the larger model, which has 512 units, got the loss almost to zero. So here, uh, the green model is basically underfitting, which means it doesn't have enough weights to adequately learn anything. With only four hidden units, it's not able to really capture all the information that's given in all the texts. But when you have 512 units, you can kind of you can pretty much memorize the the reviews, so you know what review is positive and negative. So that's how the loss is almost approaching zero because it's gotten so good at learning. But the problem with that is now you're overfitting. It's essentially memorize the review and you're never gonna see the exact same review again. So even though your loss is zero, your performance in the real world is probably gonna be not that great. Uh, if you look at the accuracy, this, it tells a similar story. Uh, the green line, it's basically at 50%, basically not learning anything with just four units. With 16 units, which is the blue, the accuracy actually does better in the end. Um, but the red has overfit. So it gets really high really quickly, but then it doesn't you know, improve after that. So yeah. So that's <clears throat> one of the ways you can kind of tune overfitting and underfitting is you change the amount of weights. Another strategy we can use is uh, weight regularization. So that's basically penalizing um, a large weight in the in the uh, in the in the model. Uh, the, it's as simple as just adding a regularizer in the when you instantiate the layers, as you can see over here. Um, and you can read more, like I said, about by just like you know, looking up the documentation, and then you can kind of see sample. Uh, Sample, uh, this is the actual Keras documentation, not the TensorFlow documentation. Sample values for the regularizer as well. Cool, so we, uh, we're gonna run this for 20 epochs, and then we're gonna compare it with our original baseline. You'll see that the loss is a bit higher, and uh, the accuracy doesn't really, Wait, hold on, is this? This is the, oh, sorry, sorry. This is uh, sorry. This is training and validation. Sorry, my bad. So yeah. Um, one second. So this is both. This is both lost. You're saying? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, my voice is starting to check out. Yeah. So we just regenerated all these notebooks. Actually, Amit wrote uh, the first version of them. And yeah. We just we just <laughs> updated all of them. So basically, green is LC train, LC val. Oh, okay, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so the green is the regularized model. Regularized model, okay, perfect. So as you can see here, the regularized model um, is not going to perform as well as the baseline model, but it's less likely to overfit because you have essentially penalized a way too large of a weight and you've kind of distributed the weights better. So this model is more likely to be better for your test set, but it's going to be not as powerful for your training set. Does anyone does anyone have any questions? I can I can see why this will be a little confusing at first glance, but I'd be happy to explain it in more detail. Yeah, so the y accuracy is lost too. I uh, see. Sorry, the y axis is lost. 
I see. So regularization is one of the techniques. And then the last technique we're going to look over is dropout. So um, you might have seen the dropout layers if you were like stem thumbing through the TensorFlow Keras layers. Dropout basically means that you are dropping out or randomly setting to zero some of the uh, weights. <clears throat> and um, here's an example, like if a given layer would have returned a vector of, of, of this, we randomly set some uh, of the output to zero. And then with at test time, instead what you do is rather than setting anything to zero, you just scale down because now all the weights will be activated. So it's as simple as just adding a dropout layer after each dense layer. Um, and that's how, you, and usually the weights are, or like dropout weights or values are set between 0.2 and 0.5. So once again, not as it won't perform as well as the uh, as the baseline model, but once again, you're less likely to overfit to your training data. Can give some additional context if you want. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Go for it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Nice job. So some additional context. So <laughs> one problem with these graphs is uh, there's so much on them they're hard to read. So let me see if I can take our giant mega graph. And let's look at the, yeah, it's going to work. So let's, let's look at what happens with each model individually. So this is our big model. And in the solid line, like Amit was saying, we have, uh, this is the accuracy on the train, this is the loss on the training set. So lower numbers are better. And what happens is when we train this model, you know, after like three epochs, it's basically going to zero. And when we look at this, we're like, oh, great. It perfectly learned the training data. But then in the uh, dash line, we're looking at the loss on the validation data. And this is like, oh, crap. It is doing horribly on the validation data. And you see how these lines diverge almost immediately? What this means is the training accuracy is going down. I'm sorry, the training loss is decreasing, which is good. And the validation loss is skyrocketing, which is horrible. So this is classic overfitting. It's memorizing the data. So this big model is terrible, and it's too big. So one thing we can do to increase the accuracy on the validation set is reduce the size of the model. And so if we do that, we can plot our smaller model and compare how it performs. So now we have a ton of stuff on the screen. So smaller is in blue. So what's interesting is that the peak loss on the training set is not as good for the smaller model. It hasn't memorized the data or gone to zero. But what's interesting is the peak loss on the validation set, which is what we actually care about, is better. So even though the smaller model hasn't gotten as high accuracy on the training data, it's actually performing better in practice on new data. And all of these models are vastly too big for this data set, even the smaller model, because you can see how quickly they're beginning to overfit. And then uh, later in the notebook, there's other strategies we can use to prevent overfitting. And dropout is a great one. It's a really funny idea. Um, it's one of these ridiculous things that tends to work really well in practice. So what dropout is doing, it's a silly idea, but it's ridiculously effective. So as you're training networks, on the left, we're looking at a cartoon diagram of a fully connected neural network. And at dropout, while we're training the network at each iteration, we're randomly selecting a subset of the neurons, or the units, and we're just turning them off. So they're gone. And it's random which subset gets deactivated. And what is happening is this forces the network to learn redundant representations. So any individual unit, it can't rely on too heavily because it might not be there. So it has to learn redundant representations which tend to generalize better. That's, that's what dropout is doing. Anyway, um, what I would do is I'd run this notebook, I'd look at the plots. Uh, if you want, you can play with it a little bit. Um, but basically, what this notebook is showing is when you're training these models, a key, key parameter to find a good value for is the number of epochs that you train the model. And in the previous notebook, early stopping is a great way to locate that. Making plots like this and looking for the point when overfitting begins to happen is a great way to locate that. And also, adjusting the size of the network and seeing how that affects overfitting and underfitting is super, super important in practice. So uh, a lot of machine learning is experimental. It's, it's 
hugely experimental. And so making plots like this in practice is super common. Um, any questions on stuff like this? Yeah. For the dropout, uh, is there an equilibration period? So if you're setting things to zero, um, are you giving it time to uh, accumulate a number back again or a weight to it back again? Yeah, so, uh, so, is, so what happens when we set the weights to zero, or when we set the units to zero? So basically they're turned off for one iteration of training. So we don't delete the weights. It's just they're just not used in computing the output for one iteration. And they're not updated okay. in that same, yeah, exactly. Yes? So it's an excellent question. So the question was, is tuning uh, the value of dropout a hyperparameter? Because there might be a sweet spot. Yes, it is. So this is why it's experimental. So all of these parameters are hyperparameters, basically knobs that can be set appropriately when you design your networks. So there's two for dropout. Well, there's actually four. One is where you use the layers. Here we, we happen to be using them after the dense layers. We don't need to. We could just delete that. Now we have one dropout layer. Dropout's always applied to the layer right below it, or I'm sorry, above it. And the other parameter is the dropout rate. So here we're dropping out 50% of the units. And we could drop out 80%, which is probably way too much, or 10%, which is maybe too little. The way to find the right value for this parameter, try different values, make plots. It's, that's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, it's just uh, a lot of compute. So it's not like gold rule or anything, it's just kind of... There are, there are empirical best practices. So typically, broadly when you're doing machine learning, there's, there's gonna be two outcomes. One is you have a generic problem, meaning I wanna classify images. If so, or I wanna classify text. If so, you're usually not writing your own model. So the way to classify images is not to write a custom image classification model. What you do is you go to the research papers and you find the latest one that works well, and then you find an open source implementation and you just train it with your data. You can do this too. This is more fun for learning or for experimenting, um, but often you don't have to write your own code. Uh, you would probably write your own code if you're doing something like structured data classification. Um, or if you're trying to train a really small image classification model that runs on your Raspberry Pi, although we have a giant collection of those shared as well. So you don't always have to write, you should, for sure, when you're learning it. But if you're working at like a giant enterprise company with a team, you don't usually have to write your own models. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, to find recommended best practices, look at the latest models from highly cited research papers and see what they do. I think we're, a few years away from having uh, a really, really awesome resource that I, I heard somebody working on, but I don't think it's anywhere uh, near ready to go, is a universal machine learning guide. And this is basically, here's text classification, here's a whole box of best practices from the following papers, here's image class, but we're a little bit away from really understanding exactly the right architecture for each problem. Yes? So, <clears throat> I'm trying to imagine a case where I have structured data, but don't actually have data for some of the fields for lay a record I'm trying to classify or do whatever on. Is a dropout technique appropriate for something like that or does something else need to be brought in? So great question. So you have structured data and you have missing values. Mm -hmm. So you have a spreadsheet and some cells are missing. There's different ways to handle that. So dropout is independent. So dropout will prevent a model from overfitting and it's almost always best practice to use it. To handle missing data, you have to feed the network something, and there's different strategies. One strategy would be fill in the missing value by taking the average of the entire row. Another would be set all your missing values to zero, and there's, or a special character, and there's different consequences of these different things. But basically, you need a strategy to handle missing data. Another one is just delete all the rows with missing data and just say your model can't handle that. But those are the, the broad things you can do. Yes? Um, does the ReLU itself have sort of a dropout built in? So if it goes below zero, does that, or do you? I wouldn't, yes, so ReLU is a funny looking activation function. So we're not gonna get into activation functions today. Okay. It's a great question, um, but it's too deep in the woods. Great question, we can talk offline though. Okay. But yes, that's, that's, 
It's slightly different than dropout. It's a great question. But it's basically ignoring values that are less than zero. It's a great question. That might be why it works. <laughs> basically, the, uh, the reason I'm punting on that, so these guys, there's a giant bucket. In the same way there are many uh, optimizers, there's a bucket of activation functions you can use. ReLU is the one that, in general, works best in practice. If you want to get into like research in neural networks, sometimes you'll see a paper. Every six months, there'll be a paper or a blog post that comes out, which is, aha, I have the Josh activation function. And I ran a bunch of experiments, and Josh function uh, tends to perform better than ReLU. And then a bunch of people will try and look at it and understand why. And then eventually, it will either be discarded, or it'll, people will find out that it's better. And then it will be implemented inside these libraries, and you'll be able to call it with you know, Josh fun. Um, and this happens on and off. The reason I'm saying just basically just always use ReLU on intermediate layers is it tends to work the best in practice at the moment. Um, previously, sigmoid was the standard, and this was found to be less efficient in practice on most problems. So now we're using ReLU. And there's others you can try too. Uh, yes? Yeah, so great question. So how can I combine structured data with high dimensional data? So a good example of that is visual question answering. And so Keras also has something called a functional API, which is really good for this. We don't have an example today. Uh, maybe we'll write one down the road. But what you can do is you can take an image, and you can also have some text. The text asks a question about the image. We've showed you, actually, it's not so bad. We could, we could write this if we had a few hours. So we've showed you how to rep, networks just take vectors as input. In MNIST, we've seen how to represent an image as a vector. In IMDB, we've seen how to represent text as a vector. Literally, all you have to do is you use a merge layer, and you just concatenate them. The network doesn't know that some is image, some is text. It just gets glued together. And you can train a network to, ask, or to answer questions about an image. Anyway, let's keep moving, but we can come back to that. It's a great question. Sorry, oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's always applied to the layer right above it. Above. Yes, it's the one guy right above it. Just the one above. Yes, exactly. Good question. Um, let me see where we're at right now. So by the way, let me, are there any JavaScript developers in the room? I know it's SciPy. All right, awesome. At least one. What about R? More. OK, the, this is the, yeah, stupid question, I know. So uh, the reason I'm mentioning uh, JavaScript and R, this is actually still useful, even if you're a Python developer. So if you go to js.tensorflow.org, so this is uh, TensorFlow in JavaScript. And uh, the reason I'm showing it to you is it uses exactly the same API that we've looked at in these notebooks. So it's, it's Keras-based inside TensorFlow. The difference is, obviously, it's JavaScript. But the reason this is valuable is you might want to deploy model, uh, models for, let's say you want to deploy a model. There's two ways to do it. One is you can use like a full production serving system like TensorFlow Serving, but you can also stick your model in the browser. And it's really good for demos. So you can train a model in TensorFlow in Python. You can do model.save, and that will give you a binary on disk. And then you can actually stick it in a web page. And um, this is probably the wrong stuff for this audience, but I just want to show you some things that this lets you do. And it's all server side. Um, has anyone seen the Pac-Man, TensorFlow Pac-Man? So I can show you this quickly. We could get a volunteer if somebody wants. So what we're going to do is this is using an image classification model that we're going to train in the browser. And this is all client side, so nothing sent to a server. And then we're going to use it to control Pac-Man. Uh, and it's really, really cool. And the reason I'm showing you this is that um, when I heard about TensorFlow.js, this was a classic moment. I'm like, oh, that seems silly to me because training machine learning models is all about huge amounts of data, and I'm a Python developer, and this didn't make sense to me. And after I started seeing their demos, I was like, oh, giant fail. It's extremely valuable, because it means that for developers that want to try your models, they can just go to a web page. There's nothing to install. The models are just running. It also is really, really, really good for interactive ML. So ML is no longer, it's just transitioned in the last year 
from basically desktop only to also web. Uh, and it's, it's a huge difference. Um, can I have a volunteer to try this? And then we will go to text generation uh, with Eager, which is really cool. I can do it, but you've already seen my face so much, I'm not sure you want to watch my face anymore. Thank you. So the way this is going to work, by the way, this uses a technique called transfer learning. Hey, I'm Josh. David. David, thanks for your help. Yeah. So under the hood, this is using a large image model that was trained on a generic data set. And what's going to happen is when David trains it, he's going to customize it. So normally training a quality model takes a huge amount of data, but we're going to do it with a small amount of data. So the way this works is, and unfortunately, you're going to have to get really close to the webcam. OK. So, so you're going to make, and this is, yeah. So OK, so this is, when you smile, yeah. we're going to have the model go left. Okay. So, so what I'm doing, so continue, and if you move your head around a little bit, got to collect lots of, if you move a little bit, so it's not perfect. OK, sorry. So yeah. we've collected 50 pictures of David smiling. So now let's have you step out of the frame entirely. So we'll collect. So when you're not in the frame at all, yeah. it's going to go up. So I'm going to collect 50 pictures of nothing. Oh, brother. Okay, smile. So smile is left. Yeah. Nothing is up. Yeah. And then we're going to need right and down. So it's kind of dumb. So <laughs> you might want to like hold a phone in front of it or something, or, uh, okay. or you can hold your um, your uh, your badge in front of it would work. Yeah. Okay. So hold on a minute. Just stick so it now, in front of the webcam. And, and now we'll make that. Uh, I stick it right in front of the webcam. Right. Sorry. It's yeah. going to be a dumb then, model. So badge is right. Yeah. And then we need something else for down. Um, I don't think the model's that smart. It's, uh, it might not well, be sensitive. How about enough. profile? No, but then I won't be able to see. Uh, you can put your hand. You can go like that. Oh, yeah, there we I go. I would do hand. hand. Hand is down. OK, great. So now we're going to train the model. So if I just hit train, and we'll give it a second. And so now the model is trained. <laughs> OK, I've got a grin. And so yeah, so let's, whoops. So let's come up with a plan. Because this is harder than it looks. So we're yeah. going to want to go left, left and, then and then up. up uh, and then, and then left we'll again. OK, so it's going to be smile, <laughs> okay. out of the way, smile. OK. All right, you ready? Yeah. What could go wrong? <laughs> the record is surviving 10 seconds. Oh, come on. It'll start in a sec. Oh, oh. OK, it's up. So you want to go. <laughs> 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 I'd smile for a while. No, keep smiling. Oh. Keep smiling. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, now you gotta get no, 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 no. Oh, you gotta go right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for your help. Appreciate it. But it's cool. So yeah, the the reason I'm showing you that is um, there's a lot of value into running models in the browser that I think is just not obvious. It wasn't obvious to me, and it's probably unless it's probably not obvious to a lot of Python developers too. So it's a good thing, FYI. Uh, js.tensorflow.org. TensorFlow.js will bring it up. <laughs> All right, so I want to briefly mention Eager, and then Yash is going to uh, show you text generation, which is really, really fun uh, using, it's basically an example of how you can use uh, lower level TensorFlow APIs on top of tf.keras to do cool things. So, if you remember back in the, so I showed you the evil way of writing TensorFlow, which you should forever ignore, uh, unless you have a specific reason. And that's using uh, deferred execution graph-based code. So there's something called eager execution, which is a different style of writing TensorFlow that you can enable to turn off deferred execution. So basically, when you import TensorFlow, there's a magical line of code you can write, which is enable eager. And right now, you have to turn this on. That might change down the road. But right now, you have to opt into it. So if you enable Eager, and this has to be run immediately after you import TensorFlow, it will switch off this deferred graph-based code and just run like normal Python. So here's code where we're multiplying two matrices. So we're using the low-level TensorFlow API to make some constants, and then we're multiplying them. But what's different in Eager is you never need to create a session. So when you run code, it just executes as it normally would in Python. So we've turned off the metaprogramming language. Eager basically means TensorFlow just works like regular Python. It's as you would expect. 
there's times when you want to turn this on. Right now, there's a performance penalty. It's significant. Um, but it enables you to write uh, uh, certain classes of models that are very difficult to write otherwise. And it makes debugging much, much easier, because it's just regular Python debugging. There's ways, if you need to, there's ways to interleave eager and graph level code. So you can mix and match, but we're not going to go into that. It's, but it's stuff you can do down the road. That's eager. Um, but if you want, I'm not going to hit the mic. And Yash is going to show us how you can use eager with uh, tf.keras, which is pretty unique and powerful. Text generation. Also, by the way, Yash is a summer intern who has done ridiculously valuable work. So in addition to writing this notebook, he also wrote notebook number six in this list, which shows you how to end-to-end -end train an English to Spanish translation model. So it's awesome. It's really good to have you. Yeah. So in text generation, we will you know, generate text based on the Shakespearean style. So the data set, which so here you can see a sample output of what the model did. So it's pretty Shakespearean, according to me. I don't know that much Shakespeare, <laughs> but yeah. So here we start off by importing TensorFlow and enabling eager execution. And then this is what the data set looks like. Yeah, so this this data set contains, you know, plays from Shakespeare, not the entire set, but some set. And so we'll start off by downloading the data set and then reading the data set. So the data set that you just saw was Unicode. So we use this Unidecode library to convert in to convert it to ASCII. And then so in text generation, what we are basically doing is we are trying to predict each character. So you, you just saw the text. So we will just give the model one starting character and it will predict the next character based on the previous character. And then it has those two characters and then it will predict the next character after that. So that process just goes on. So for that, we need all the unique characters in the data set. So we just do, you know, sort it and create a character to index mapping and a reverse mapping which does index to character. So the model that we saw doesn't expect strings, right? So it expects numbers. So let me just start this off. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is how you can download, as Josh, Josh mentioned earlier. So once you enable eager, if you run this cell again, it won't allow you. It'll just throw an error. So you just have to restart the runtime and ex uh, run that cell again. So this is what the char2 index looks like. Yeah, so each character has a corresponding mapping index to it. So the model expects numbers. So each character in the data set will be converted to its own index. And that's how you'll train that <coughs> model. So here we set the maximum length of our data set to 100. So at a time, e the model will get 100 characters or a 100 length sequence as an input to it. So. Here we create that. So for example, let's say your max length is nine and your input, you know, you, your data set con contains TensorFlow. So the input will be this thing, sorry. Your input will be T, N, S, R, S, O, R, F, L, O, and your output will be the next characters, uh, each next character after that. So the model will learn to predict if you input T, so the model will predict E. If you input E, the model will predict N. So it'll learn those patterns, basically. So we create the input text and the target text. Also. And 
and then tf dot data is a really cool data set api that you can use to batch shuffle and do you know all sorts of things and it has uh, so if you have a huge data set you can do parallel processing using that so yeah i hope you try that out so we'll just create batches of data so right now the batch size that we have given is 64 so it will create 64 by 100 batches of data from this thing so now here we create our model so we have an embedding layer we have an rnn layer and we have a dense layer so i'm not going to go into the details of what an rnn does but amit has already explained what an embedding layer is so all the so in short what embedding layer does is if you have a word say w so each word will get a 256 dimension representation of that so here we have defined embedding dimension as 256 so each word will have a 256 dimension representation so tensorflow has this really cool word to vec thing in which man uh, let's say for example man has some representation woman has some representation king has some representation and queen has some representation so if you subtract king to queen king minus queen and you do oh sorry not subtract if you calculate the distance of king to queen and man to woman they will be same or you know close to same so that's what embedding is so in our data set, each character will be given a specific embedding, so a 256 dimension representation of each character, and that will be passed via uh, RNN layer. In this case, it's a GRU. So GRU and LSTMs are two kinds of RNN that we use. So uh, the GRU will output will give an output as the output and state. So output is the batch size, as I mentioned, uh, sorry, the shape of the output will be batch size by max length by the hidden size, and the output of states will be batch size by hidden size. So this is complex, but let's run through that. And here we'll initialize the model. Now, the main thing, you have seen that in tf.keras, the last layer has an activation as softmax, right? Because when you use model.compile, you put loss equal to categorical cross entropy. So the loss that Keras expects is softmax. But when you do, when you use TensorFlow losses, like here we are using tf.losses, it expects logits and not a softmax output. So Whenever you use TensorFlow losses, be very careful as so as to not specify soft activation as softmax. Otherwise, your model won't train and it will fail and you won't know why it will fail because it doesn't give a output like, hey, your loss is not wrong. So you, you have to be careful as what you give the output. <coughs> so let's set the output and this is what a training loop looks like in eager mode so in eager mode you can do all this funky stuff or all sorts of flexible stuff that you want to do like loss masking as someone was asking me and doing gradient uh, clipping and all those things so you can do all that stuff in eager mode i'm not going to go into the detail of how this works but yeah, this is, we just loop through epochs and we uh, you loop through the data set that we created using tf.data and we predict using, uh, you know, we predict the input, we send the input to the model and we get its prediction and the hidden state. We calculate the loss of the input and the prediction and then we calculate the gradients and we do a backprop and an updation step. And okay, we each epoch in e right now will take 23 seconds, give or take. We, we let's just train it for 10, and this will take some time. But okay, 
Okay, so resource exhaustion. <laughs> okay, so should I shift your account? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so when as we have been as we have been running a lot of notebooks, uh, the resource, the RAM, we didn't clear the RAM at all. So if this happens to you, you just do bank kill hyphen nine hyphen one. And if you want to know what's happening inside the training loop, you can read this part because this is pretty interesting. We couldn't do this before in uh, TF in Kiras. We can't do this stuff. You can do this in normal graph execution TensorFlow, but it's very difficult to do that. So in the eager mode allows us to do this flexible stuff. So you can read through this stuff, and you know you'll understand what's going on. But I would recommend reading what an RNN is first and what it returns and how the states work. Yeah. Should I just switch the account? Yeah, we need a different browser. We've just exhausted the memory on this particular collab instance. I hope I don't have anything weird open. <laughs> I'm on Reddit. Nice, working hard. <laughs> Oh, it's good. Yeah. Oh, great. You might have to restart and run yeah. all the whole thing. Great. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, bank kill hyphen nine hyphen one. Any questions up till now before yeah. we start training? Yes. Um, why did you have to like create the batches? Okay. Is, this, is it because it's, it's the eager mode and you have to do it? No. So the previous no notebooks that you saw, those notebooks also did batches. batches. We do batches just to speed up the training because if you do one input at a time, you're not utilizing GPU to its full efficiency. Right. But why did you have to do it like this? Because you can't. Yeah, so yeah, so good question. Uh, we are not using model.fit, so in Kira's model.fit has a parameter known as batch size. Here, as here we are doing our own training loop, we need to create a data set before that and batch it and then give it I'll as an input to the model. Like batches of 64 yeah. Oh, okay. no, okay. yeah. okay. I'll just switch. Yeah. Is it in full screen mode? Yeah, here I got it, yeah. <coughs> I'm just getting the URL for you. Do, 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 do. Another quick question? Yeah. For the embedding dimension, you chose 256. Yeah, so that's a hyperparameter. You can choose 128, 64, 1. Yeah. You just have to experiment with it. Yeah, there's no other option. You wanted five? Five Yeah, plus. OK. Here, I'll just do a run all. Oops. Nice. <clears throat> so these are all hyperparameters that I have done. So units is the number of RNN units or grew units here in, in this case. Batch size is 64. You can, yo you can use 128 if your GPU or if Collab allows it. It'll just train faster. And embedding dimension, yep. And max length, yeah, you can play with, your, play with the max length. You can either make it 64. That might lead to a good output than 100. Okay, so it is training right now, so. Yeah, so basically there's gonna be two. <laughs> this is great, let me just make a comment. 
So this is awesome. So basically, there's going to be two takeaways from this. Uh, the first is that it's fun. So there's a single line of, so we'll be generating Shakespeare when this trains, because this is our first non-trivial model, so it takes a little while to train. But the fun part is in addition to generating Shakespeare, you can have it generate text of any sort you like uh, by just changing the text data set. So the only input is a giant text file. So you can actually give it the source code to the Linux, Linux kernel, and it will generate Linux kernel-like source code as an output. It's really fun. And then, so there's the fun takeaway. And then the other takeaway is exactly like Asher's saying, this is a demonstration of how you can use the tf.keras layers uh, in combination with the rest of the TF stack. And so in truth, this is something you'd only do really as an undergraduate student, like towards the end of a deep learning class, or if you're doing research, or if you really want to go under the hood. So it's always optional, but it's as far as this is the best way I know of doing research today. It's a really, really good combination. Um, what I like about tf.keras is it's both the best API for beginning, and I think uh, in this mode, it's also the best API for research. So it's hit this really cool uh, sweet spot. Um, anyway, while this is chugging away. Yeah. And to add to his point, you can also use this for debugging. So suppose you don't know the shape of a input to embedding or what embedding outputs. So you can't, you know, particularly get shapes in sequential model. It's difficult to do that, but here you can just do print x dot shape and you'll get a shape in the call, call method where you define the model. If you just do print, you know, output dot shape, it'll just print out the shape. So it basically it's just Python. You write code as you write in Python and it just works. So it's really cool. You can use this mode for debugging and then just turn off eager execution and you can use it using simple keras. So yeah, we have trained now. Let's do the prediction. So for prediction here, uh, here we are just giving the start string q. And as I said, we are, uh, we'll use this uh, start string to predict the next word. So it'll predict something and then we'll use the context of those two words and we'll predict the third word. So it's just feeding what it predicted back into itself and predict the next word again. Yeah, so that's what's happening here. So here we will predict a thousand characters. Yeah. And so, okay, so as we've just trained for five epochs, but it did learn that Romeo should be capital, and then you have a semicolon after that. The first word begins with a capital letter of every sentence. Yeah, it figured that out. There's a comma. Yeah, and it's pretty, <laughs> it is Shakespeare-like. So, yeah. So what's interesting, so one thing to notice about this, so it looks like we're stuck in some sort of loop. If we train for longer, that would go away. I see the same, I see the same sentence again and again. But what's really, really interesting, it ran for what, like two minutes? So remember, when we started training this model, it's character-based. So it doesn't have any knowledge of what's a word. It doesn't understand the notion of a word. It doesn't understand the notion of a valid English word. So in the amount of time we've trained it for, not only does it have Shakespeare-like structure, but there's words. Some of them are not words, like cursed with a Q. But if you look, already the majority are English-like. And so if you train it for 30 epochs, like we have it, it generates text. It's obviously not Shakespeare. But you know, if you squint your eyes a little bit, or you, it's not terrible. And if you run it on the Linux kernel source code, it will spit out code that looks a lot like C. Probably won't compile or mean anything, but you know, yeah. it looks in C-like. Uh, you can also try it for rap lyrics. Um, it's really, really fun. Um, it's a really powerful thing. Yeah. And it's, it's super fun. Just get a ASCII data, a data set and just replace the link and this model will work out of the box. So let's, you know, let's try W. <laughs> It'll print out something else. Yeah. <laughs> so that so. first line is not actually bad, right? I mean, if you think of like a crappy poetry contest or something, but it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, 
if you want to you can try adding another rnn layer making the code more complex yeah is it limited to the concordance that made up the primary text or or does it extrapolate uh so the words that it has predicted are you know strange might be in the text so it might have you know learned from the text but it's character based so we don't know how it works yeah it, it can generate, generate word. yeah unique word also if you just train it for one epoch yeah it'll generate a unique word that you might not have seen just like any other model let's say we trained it for like 5000 epochs eventually we just memorize shakespeare, shakespeare just yeah something from the text <laughs> Well, what's interesting about these models is before they've memorized the data, they're generating unique. So they're really fun. Yeah, just, try tra just try training it for one epoch, and you might see one word that, as you saw previously, coerced, something like that. And that's not a word. It just did something. <laughs> There's also a really good resource called Project Gutenberg. And Project Gutenberg it has thousands of open, I think they're open source. I don't know what the license are, but it has thousands of ebooks you can download for free. Do you know the license? Are they They're public, do They're public the domain. domain. Awesome. Expired. Awesome. So it has thousands of public domain books. Thanks. You can download it. You can train like an Alice in Wonderland text generation model. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, when I try to run that training step, it t gives me the search stack overflow. Is there anything I can do about that? So, can you repeat the error, please? The training step gives me an error of uh, search stack overflow. Uh, yeah. I, I can walk over and see what the problem is. One option is you can restart the Yeah, restart the runtime. Run. Oh, yeah, we'll take a look. I just grabbed this link, by the way, off your GitHub. It's like some. Yeah. yeah. You might uh, try switching to a different account or just do bank kill hyphen nine hyphen one and then check if it works. If you do bank kill hyphen nine hyphen one, exclamation kill. Anyway, what I recommend doing, let's take 10 minutes. If you want, run it on Shakespeare, it's fun. If this is your first time playing with RNN, you might as well. <coughs> if you want to swap out, try a different data set, and you can run it when you get home and generate some cool text. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll figure out what to do next. Do a nice job. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I wanted to point you to also, oh, nice microphone now is for people that are working with structured data, building models and structured data, especially in production, there's a really excellent paper that I wanted to point you to, which is related. It's, it's not really a paper in the traditional sense, so it's what's your machine learning test score? And I really, really like this paper. It was a workshop paper at NIPS a few years ago. And what it is, it's just a collection of best practices in bullet point form. So it's not academic, but what's your machine learning test score? And what's cool, it's just a bunch of tips and tricks for developing models that you're actually going to use in production. And some of these will be obvious, like when you're running your system, just make sure that your features aren't suddenly zero. So just have a test to check for all zero features. And some might be not obvious, and they talk about different distributions of data and stuff like that. But it's, um, machine learning is relatively new still in production, and best practices are still being understood, and this is just a really excellent collection that's uh, just super, super useful. And it's an easy read, so just FYI. Um, another thing, I wanted to point you to learning resources. So these will be, or some variation of this will be on tensorflow.org in a week or two. But anyway, uh, sadly, you, these are all Googly. You're all, man, I need to sleep. You can Google all of them. I'm trying to say that you can't click on the links because I'm projecting a Google Doc. But uh, here's some good educational resources. So MLCC, or Machine Learning Crash Course, my personal opinion is it's excellent for concepts and skip the code. Uh, and you should wait a week and just use tf.keros instead and you'll be happier. Uh, this is a really nice course from Stanford that walks through TensorFlow. Um, the instructor is great, her name's Chip. It might not be totally current, actually it's almost certainly not current with our latest APIs because we're just publishing them now, but it's still got a lot of really valuable content, especially for background on how the other APIs we haven't covered today work. This is a really, really excellent course from Stanford that obviously goes into detail on image classification, but it also has a great section on K nearest neighbors. So it has, it's a very, very high quality educational resource on just ML 101. Uh, this book you should absolutely read. It's a book about the Keras API. 
wonderful. It doesn't touch TensorFlow at all. It's just straight Keras. But the TensorFlow version of the Keras API is a superset of what you learn in this book. So there's no wasted energy by reading the book. Uh, it's great. Uh, yeah, this one is also very, very good, but the TensorFlow section is now out of date. Um, however, the first half is awesome, and Scikit-Learn is another really excellent library that is uh, worth your time to take a look at. And then if you're academic, uh, this is a really great book, too. So this is more for uh, PhD students or you know, people that have months to spend, but this is machine learning uh, mathematically built up. It's really great. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let me think if I have any other content for you right now. So is that going to be posted on the platform? Yeah, and about whenever 1.9 is final, we'll update the docs. So give or take a week. Another good resource, I know I'm throwing like a million links at you. Um, another good resource, we recently had a developer summit. And if you search for TensorFlow Developer Summit, there's a bunch of videos uh, that are on YouTube. Uh, and you can listen to people like Jeff Dean talk about, there's actually some really good content here. The keynote's worth a watch, um, and then there's also deep dives technically into areas uh, that might be of interest to you. Then, yeah, this, this is basically the next steps. It's wait a week, then go to tensorflow.org, and then there'll be more content too. Um, so yeah, I think I'll be around, and we'll all be around for a while basically indefinitely, happy to take any questions offline. I'm gonna end this 20 minutes early because I know it's been a long, uh, long day so far. Thanks very much uh, for coming, everybody. Really appreciate it. Hope this was helpful, and uh, yeah, we'll be around. Thanks.